long days, pleasant nights, and welcome to Kingslingers, a doof media podcast journeying through Stephen King's Dark Tower series and beyond. I am your host, constant reader Scott Daly, and joining me as always, he's just bought some great beachfront property on Duma Key itself. It's Matt Freeman. How's it going today, Matt? I've been looking to start up painting, you know, so. Mm. Great, great, great. I'm sure. Don't worry about those storm clouds, though. The whole place is going to be totally fine. I love a nice little rainstorm. <laughs> this week, our eight part coverage of Stephen King's Duma Key reaches its end as we take one final look at the novel in our overview episode. For this episode, we are going to be joined by the absolutely incredible Kim C of the underrated Stephen King podcast. King, Kim is going to be joining us just here in a moment. We actually recorded that part um, before this part, so we're technically the future, and uh, and we can say with absolute confidence that it is a great conversation. Uh, it's, yes. It's, 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 it was so much fun. Love having Kim on. Uh, it was great. It was great. Yeah, it was a great time. Y'all are in for a treat. You are. Uh, after we chat with Kim for a little bit, uh, we're going to be back to cover some of your mailbag questions. So uh, don't leave when Kim leaves. Stick around. We're going to answer some questions. And then, and then we're going to wrap this whole thing up. That's it. That's that's the show. All right. All right, Matt. Let's go to us and Kim. <laughs> All right, folks. We are here once again with Kim C. from the year of underrated Stephen King podcast. Kim, we're so happy to have you back. I told you when uh, when we met to discuss it that we had to have you back on as soon as possible. And and I secretly was hoping that it would be for Duma Key because I know during our conversations, uh, you mentioned how much you love this book. So we figured, hey, we want to talk with Kim again. Uh, we have to talk about Duma Key. So it's the perfect, the perfect excuse. So welcome back to the show. Thank you guys so much for having me. I am beyond thrilled, freaking out. It's so good to see you guys. Yeah, well, at least this way, there's at least one person who who's, uh, this book makes them happy. <laughs> <laughs> <She's> yeah. <mad. laughs> I got a lot of feelings. We'll break them down for sure. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess to kind of to kind of start um, with you and and your feelings about this book, like you know, we had talked I think broadly back a few months ago about about how much you love this book, but kind of talk to me about like what is it about this book that you love so much? Why why is Doom McKee kind of so special for you? I love this question. Well, so I'm kind of with you, Matt. Where I do, I am very sad by saddened by this book. Like this book wrecks me. But I believe now that it's been three times I've gone through it, I'm kind of haunted by it in both good and bad ways. And so the beauty of the writing, the beauty of the visuals, all this art, all of the themes, there's so much richness in this story. The fact that we've got like 300 pages of slow burn buildup and the setting is everything. So that's what makes me fall in love with it. But then this very tragic, these tragic moments throughout. And of course, the ending is an absolutely, uh, an absolute assault on the soul. That's what keeps me thinking about it month after month, year after year. It, it haunts me. And so <laughs> I am haunted in good and bad ways by the beauty and the tragedy. Yeah, that that's awesome. I mean, I I I kind of I feel <laughs> a little bit on the outside for for bo both of you in that, <laughs> um, you know, one of you know we have we have um, some mailbag questions we're going to cover a little bit later. But one of our questions was so perfect to this conversation, I thought we'd just ask it now and talk about it because one of our listeners, baby, can you dig dig your Sam says Stephen King has described Duma Key as hopeful. He said he was in a much better place after his accident um, when he wrote this. And, and, you know, <laughs> I think the sentiment coming from y'all is that this is a, this is a depressing, sad book. I think the quote from King himself, uh, ironically, is comparing this book to Desperation in that uh, he says, if Desperation is a book that's full of pain and unhappiness, Duma Key is a book where there is actually hope because I was feeling in a more hopeful place. The two books are really the priorities of my recovery from the polarities of the, my recovery from my accident. I was feeling a lot better by the time that I wrote Duma Key. And I think it shows in the book. So is, is he just crazy? <laughs> like, I mean, like, is, is just like, is just the Stephen King barometer for hopeful, just very, very different from, from y'all's or from, from most people's. I, 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 for my part, 
I do see the hopefulness in the book. I see, you know, I think one of our, our, our listeners last week talked about how the book has such like a wistful tone where it's not, it's not necessarily that it's it, dour, but it's just like, it's just thinking. I mean, it's, it's a book about memory as the book told us directly. Right. And it, it's, it's looking back on these memories with this, this level of sadness, but, but, uh, but, but love, um, and, and it does in my mind have, have a little bit of hope in it. So am I, are we, are me and Steven just wrong? Is that, is that, is that where we're at? I mean, just the, the objective place that the character is in at the end of the book <laughs> is that he was body was horribly crushed and he lives in pain and his wife divorced him. And then he got a second chance as a painter. And then that was taken away from him by a literal demon <laughs> who also may have killed all of his friends, plus or minus, and his daughter. And everyone hates him now. And he lives in Mexico, where he went following his one remaining friend who is now dead. So, like, it's it's just a very it, – it's a very depressing ending. Now, now I, I'll say – the situation of Edgar and his like point of view is, is I, I agree with you that he has this sort of indefatigable personality where it's like when he says, I haven't given up on the possibility that something good will happen to me. That's not like a bitter, sarcastic, like, like my life is complete shit, but me, who knows? Maybe, maybe I shouldn't kill myself. No, he, he's like, good things can still happen. Like there's still, there's always a chance. And, and it, but it's like, it's from such a position of, of like just sadness to me, especially the wire. Like I just have to, to end this statement with like this whole book, like Kim was just saying, it's so slow, meditative. You spend so much time getting to know these characters. Wireman is this guy you just love. And then to kill him at the end like that is just such a, like you were already sad but we were holding out this little little nugget of hope to you, and then we just snatch it away and punch you in the face. Um, that's that's my and this isn't even me criticizing the book, by the way. This is just like this is why I feel the way I feel. That's all. Sure. Yeah. Kim, what do you what do you think? <laughs> so I agree with both of you, which I know isn't a help, but I think it's ratio. The ratio of hope to dread is not balanced so because <laughs> i there's a lot of beauty in this book right we've got the recovery of the body we have the discovery of talent the creation of art these are all beautiful things we also have all these lovely female characters who bring a lot of light and and hope and happiness and joy but then this it the it really rocks the boat with the second half and so the bleak the amount of bleak and tragic things that happen i feel overshadow the hope a little bit and the fact that where we the, how the novel ends is very somber and it's not hopeful enough to make me smile about it <laughs> yeah i i, I... I guess I guess here's where I'll stand and and I'll I'll make my case here and I and and I think what King was thinking when he meant this when he said this I I think this is a book where we meet the character of Edgar in a suicidal state essentially right like not even essentially he is suicidal he's contemplating suicide and and he he's gone through this horrible ordeal he's his body's recovering but but it's it's destroyed his life and he's ready to kind of throw in the towel and then he finds this this second wind. He goes through this experience. He finds meaning again, and then he suffers another horrible tragedy, uh, arguably a worse horrible tragedy. Like I, I, I don't want to rank tragedies, but I feel like losing your daughter is is worse than losing an arm. Like I think I would happily give up my my arm for my daughter. Um, and and at the end of the book, we don't see him as a man who's suicidal. We don't see as, him as a man who is is ready to, to toss in the towel and say, "This I've had enough of life. I'm done." He he's a person who has learned to live with the tragedies that happen and look towards some potential optimistic future that that could possibly be out there. And that to me is yes, like for if we're if we're ratioing, if we're measuring, if we're, <laughs> if we're adding math to the equation, yeah, there's more depressing things than hopeful things here. But I think in in the mind of King perhaps the only thing that matters is that there's just a little bit. Like even if there's just a little bit, that that little bit can be enough. 
Um, and, and that's like, that's the part that I desperately glom onto because I mean, I'm not saying I'm not sad at the end of this book. I certainly was, it was a a really depressing ending. The wireman part does feel particularly cruel. Um, but, but I I, like just seeing that Edgar is a character and, and and I kind of like how subtly this is done because it's not like he comes right out and says in the last few pages, it was like, but at least I have hope or at least like, it's just kind of subtly reinforced throughout the whole structure of the book being from this perspective of a guy looking back on it. And we've, gosh, Kim, I want to talk to you about the autobiographical nature of this book because we talked for like 17 hours about it. (laughs) I'm worried we talked about it too much. I want to get your take on it. But like, as, as a reference of a guy who's just gone through a horrible accident is now six, seven, eight years removed from that accident, like being able to look back on it and say like, this was the worst time in my life, like ever. Like, I, I can't believe I got through this but I've gotten through it now and I feel like I could get through anything. If I made it through this, if I made it at the end of this thing in one piece, then what, what can't I survive? Um, and I don't know. That's at the end of the day to me, hopeful. <laughs> that tracks, that tracks. I think what you guys touched on and it might've been the final episode or the one before it about endurance and resilience. And that is the huge overarching or overarching theme. and that that's where the hope is that tiny little glimmer of he hasn't thrown in the towel yet despite it all mm-hmm. yeah i i think one thing that may sort of vary from person to person is like whether you believe that he really is going to start his third life now <laughs> or whether such a thing is even possible and and the sure. book clearly wants you to believe that it is and and i guess i guess I like within the frame of the book, I guess I have to accept that it, it is the case. It's just very hard to imagine. And it it feels like, um, demoralizing in, in some way. And all, and I think part of it is also like, I think I can imagine like being in a, a physical accident and recovering from that and, and be like being okay but I can't imagine losing a child and just being like, all right, time for time for 3.0. Like it's just like you don't. And, and the thing is, I obviously have no firsthand experience with this, but it just doesn't feel the same to me. But I, but yeah. I think I think King is taking it to that extreme point so that he can he can make this statement about kind of th- there's nothing so bad that can happen to you that you can't reinvent yourself and recover from it. And yeah. Uh, m- maybe recover isn't quite the right word. We discussed this a bit that like, it's not like he just put himself back together and now he's fine. It's like he becomes a new person. He becomes the next version of whoever he's going to be. Um, and and it's never what it was before, but it can still be something really good. And, and I, I think I do believe that. It's just, like I said, you, if he hadn't killed Wireman, it would <laughs> all be it would all be different. I would be, it'd be singing a totally different tune here, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I, 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 to your to your credit, though, I, I think the book does not make it exactly clear how Edgar's life in Mexico is going. Right. Like like we, we know he's there and we know he's at this point where he's like wistfully looking back on the past. But like we don't get the and yeah, I did buy the hotel and yeah, I'm running this hotel and it's a successful hotel. And I'm like we 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 have to kind of, you know, pick up the how Edgar is doing from hints and and the way he structures sentences and the way he talks and the way he references things and like so I, I, to, to like to give you all the credit in the world like if King wanted to make it absolutely clear that Edgar has has successfully initiated act three of his life he could have done it and he didn't he, he, he didn't he didn't make it that straightforward so I think ultimately it's it, it's yeah, whether whether you want to believe that that's even possible, and I and I think I want to, um, mm-hmm. and and that's perhaps why I see I see that little little bit of that little speck of hope a little bit more more than than you guys do. Yeah, I just I, I noticed some comments on our um, like YouTube video and and elsewhere where you know one comment would be like, yeah, this this book just sent me into a depression and, and and then the next comment would be like i found it kind of hopeful and and and, <laughs> and, and i'm like and, and like i i can see it hope as as hopeful i just have to kind of step back from my own reaction yeah because because i agree with you I'm, I'm not saying like oh you're reading it wrong i'm what i'm like is that that tone of wistfulness that 
that um you know you, you i think it's really interesting what you were just saying like the the uh it, it's almost down to word choice and, and like the, the tone the tone of of point of view more than anything else more than any fact of the matter is just yeah. he's he's like well, better better pick myself up and brush myself off and get back on the horse. And you're like, okay, I, I guess he's <laughs> going to do that, you know. Um, yeah. So, so Kim, why, why did Stephen King kill Wireman? <laughs> why why did he do this? Oh God! Well, that's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite portions in the novel is when Wireman is talking about La Lotaria. And mm-hmm. how he had this immense luck with his wife and his daughter and, uh, you know, how it all the numbers just fell into place for him. But then the wheel came around again, so to speak, and they were all taken away. And so I feel it was perhaps an extension of that. Wireman was saved by Edgar's painting for the mission, for his purpose, the purpose he fulfilled in the story, in, in his heroism and helping all the things the white coming through of course as you guys mentioned but i i have a feeling that once purpose was fulfilled la, la, la loteria and they he just wanted us to really get one more gut punch and reflect on maybe it was one last sacrifice to percy i don't know <laughs> one last like Everybody involved in the paintings and the dark energy of Percy was not going to come out okay. Like, yeah. it was cursed. It was the hand of this evil fate had its claws on everybody that Edgar loved. So I kind of go dark with that, but that's, uh, I don't know. It's either the dark hand of fate. Or for us to kind of reflect on his time was borrowed anyway, given the fact he shot himself in the head and lived, yeah. you yeah. know, so he was always on borrowed time. Yeah, that's an important thing that I need to remind myself of. I, I also, I mean, the, the desperation comparison is not one that I ever would have thought of making naturally, but so many <laughs> things pop up when you really consider it. Like, especially if you think about the character of David as being candidate for the protagonist of that book anyway and similarly like he he loses everything in the same way that edgar loses everything everything important to him um there's even a, a, a almost wire wireman like moment where you're like well at least he's gonna keep the one family member in the books like no he's not gonna keep any family members we're gonna <laughs> make sure of this and and nobody no, basically nobody's making it out of this except for yeah very little silver lining there and it's very similar to this book in that regard where it's like almost the whole quartet um doesn't make it out except for the one person and it's it's a sort of like almost um uh uh, okay so like desperation has all of these explicitly christian ideas of like sacrifice and i'm trying and failing to kind of bridge that gulf and be like is is this and I guess Kim, you just kind of you just said this basically is it's it's like there had to be a sacrifice, and it's a and it, it's the metaphysical quid pro quo of Stephen King's universe. I guess I don't personally love that, like personally, <laughs> but like that, that could totally that that could be what's going through his mind when he makes these decisions. Yeah, I mean, I I think that's part of it. I also just think like part of the the terror of the accident that that king had and that that edgar had was the randomness of it was that like you know and and i think part of part of the the thing that scares him perhaps and 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 can scare people is you know you put all this work in to survive right like like all this work like wireman goes looks west was like an arduous like week-long thing that brought wireman back from the dead essentially um and that all that can be taken away in an instant where he's just hanging out in a market. It's it's not like nothing happens. Like there's, there's no, there's nothing. It's just, he's in a market and he has a heart attack and that's it. And, and then like that happens all the time. Like people just die, right? Like people just mm-hmm. die all the time randomly and meaninglessly. And it's just, and, and it's, it's terrifying, but it's, it's part of life. And, and, and especially, you know, thinking of this, it, we've, we've kind of been taking this, chronologically through king 
thing from 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 the beginning and and we've entered the 2000s now he, he's past middle aged right he is at a part, part in his life where i forget i forget where i heard the quote from originally but you know you've reached a part of life where life stops giving you things and starts taking things away and i think he's he's entered that phase of his life and just seems very cognizant of that fact that like all these people like that line is like we always think we'll have the time but we but we never do we're always always wrong about that um and i just think that's part of him processing his near death experience but you know one one of the things that uh, other people mentioned um that we didn't haven't really talked about is uh god what's his name the guy who did the audiobooks for dark tower um that that had the horrific uh accident as well the motorcycle accident i can't remember his name thousands of people are yelling at me right now as I struggle with it. And Matt is too. Matt can't think of it either. I got um, nothing. I love yeah. him. I don't yeah. remember his name. Oh, no, he's my favorite. <laughs> uh, anyway, we'll, we'll, don't worry. We'll get emails that, and we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll straighten it up next week. Um, the, he, he had a, a really bad motorcycle accident that eventually led to his death. Right. And, and Mueller. so like Muller, Frank Muller. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. See, we got it. So now no one <laughs> can get mad at us because we yeah. got there eventually. And just like just this idea of like the more the more you live and the more things you experience in life, the more often you're going to experience stuff like this where it just happens and it's not fair and you don't want it to happen. Like why he I, I, maybe we can use this as a transition period to talk about Wireman in general, because he's like one of my favorite of I think we called him that guy uh, in our, our discussion question. But he's like one of my favorite King side characters ever, like ever. He's just so well drawn and defined like so instantly likable and memorable like if you, if you remember nothing from this book in 10 years the thing that you'll remember is wireman um and and then yeah so this of course is the one we have to cruelly take away from you i don't know mm -hmm. i just talked for a while there <laughs> sorry <laughs> I didn't, not really posing a question just kind of thinking no. out loud no I, I think i think you're right i mean i, I think one um Thing that that I, I'm introspecting on about myself and my relationship to this book is um, we're, we're kind of you and me, Scott, anyway, are on that like middle age line where we really don't want to admit that we're moving into the part of our lives where <laughs> life stops giving us things and starts taking them away. I'll speak for myself. I don't want to admit that I'm moving into a domain where <laughs> life's going to start taking stuff away. I really like being given things. It's, it's great. Um, and and like that's like i i i think 10, 10 or 15 years down the line like you you do have to develop a kind of like attitude of uh optimism in the face of these yeah. challenges right it's easy to be optimistic when life is handing you flowers every day that you wake up it's it's a different thing to be optimistic when you've just been hit by a van and you're like trying to decide how you're going to feel about that and how the rest of your life is going to go. So, mm -hmm. so that to me, like it's a more mature and nuanced kind of optimism. It's not the, yeah. it's not Pollyanna ish optimism. It's like, come what may we're, this is going to be a ride and we're all going to die eventually. So why not just kind of have a, have a fun time while we're here? Like yeah. I, 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 I can, I can dig it. Like, like actually, like I'm not just, I'm not just kind of trying to, to meet you halfway. Like I think the book is saying that it's, it, it just, um yeah what i said before it, it's sad yeah, yeah. I, I think the comparison he makes to desperation like you mentioned i think is the greatest thing in the world to me because i didn't i didn't know I, this quote that that it was in a i believe it was in a time magazine interview from 2009 with with king that that sam shared with us i didn't know he directly compares duma key and desperation i didn't know that when i when i selected both of these books for our our mm -hmm. uh, our, our episodes and it's it's great because we talked about this, and again, unknown to me, we talked about this idea that perhaps desperation is King talking about how an incredibly traumatic, acute event changes you, and 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 trying to find meaning of those things. And he talked about that as a person who perhaps has not experienced that kind of incredibly traumatic, acute event like the characters in Desperation do. And then Duma Key is him years after actually experiencing one of those events and writing about it. And as you said, I think it's 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 perhaps more mature. Um, it is it is more complex in how it's dealing with and and uh, looking through those things. And 
that's great. That's great. Because yeah, like we, we talked about that. We were, we're on that wavelength. I'm so happy about it. But yeah, two very, very different books that I think reach not dissimilar conclusions about like how, how to survive in the face of, of terrible stuff, but one like one like demanding to find meaning in it and the other and do almost accepting the randomness of it. Mm-hmm. Perhaps. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot actually. Yeah. All right. Um, Kim, I, I want to talk to you about the, why this book is so underrated as your, that's your word. That's, that's <laughs> you, you own that word now. So for sure. Um, yeah. One of the things we said at the very beginning was that, that I just think of this as kind of an unloved book um, by the masses, at least, you know, one big thing has never been adapted. Um, no one has ever loved this book enough to try to get the rights and make it into something. So what do you think? What is it about this book that, that, that it doesn't res perhaps doesn't resonate as well with people to be considered one of those top tier King novels. Oh gosh. I, it breaks my heart. Like when I think about it, because when I first read doom and key several years ago, I wanted to become a manic street preacher about it. I just wanted to <laughs> shout on the sidewalk of my bill. Like, ah, this is the most brilliant thing. But when I talk to other King folk and other constant readers are like, I had a hard time getting into that one. And I was like, what? Excuse me, what? But <laughs> I do get it. It is the pacing. My first theory is pacing because mm-hmm. we've got a very slow burn. We've got 300 pages where things are seemingly okay. There's not a lot of mystery yet until around page 350 when we really start to get the Skoto gallery up and running, the show, we're building towards the show. And then when we finally get that spooky Embry arrival and then things at Big Pink start to turn monstrous. So we've got 350 pages, which is a traditional novel size of a lot of rumination and a lot of delicate mystery threads. We don't even know if we're supposed to be paying attention to them yet. It's just Edgar and his beach walks and the paintings. And yes, there's a little bit of magic going on. Some of the things that he paints are happening, but there's no sinister yet. So my first theory is it's got to be pacing because I believe King readers are used to that really big chum bucket of like, oh my God, I'm following this. Here's the bad guy. Here's our protagonist. Let's get into it. Let's go on the journey. Well, the journey is very long and drawn out for a long time. Mm -hmm. And if you're not patient, which a lot of us aren't in this (laughs) world of social media, instant dopamine gratification, (laughs) like we don't have the patience for crap anymore. So it's, it's a more challenging narrative pacing is is why i think and then ultimately second theory our villain is slightly ambiguous Mm -hmm. ambiguous in gender ambiguous in origin and that's what really lights my fire but i know for others that's kind of like if there's not a lot of concrete detail then they're not going to latch onto it and they're like oh it's just like some red hooded witch thing i don't know <laughs> and it's like oh my god no it's everything don't you understand <laughs> like let's it could be this west african destroyer goddess for all we know we don't know <laughs> so i i go to my own crazy town with possibilities but i understand some people don't they do want it fed to them and that's okay mhm mhm yeah let's let's talk about percy a little bit more cuz i i think i think you're right i, I i'm I'm into her, it, whatever, as as a <laughs> as a very Ill, Ill, undefined villain. Like I, I think King has has a lot of fun with leaving a lot of this open and just like like I feel like it's such a difference. Like Pennywise and it is is pretty like pretty undefined, but we still spend a lot of time like drawing the edges of, of what, what it is and, and what it can re- represent and where, where it comes from and all these things. And, and I think it is really interesting that Percy is just like the, the book almost just says, yeah, it might be this, but I don't know. And it doesn't matter. <laughs> so we're just going to move on. You can decide what it means for yourself. It's just really interesting choice that, that King did not feel the need to really dive into that anymore. What, what is it about that? I, I guess in particular that, that works so well for you, Kim. 
Oh gosh. Well, first of all, gents, I went real tinfoil hat with this. I really <laughs> did because I love, why did he have to make her female? The fact mm-hmm. that he did that sent me spiraling. So that mm-hmm. was so cool for me because I started researching every single aquatic goddess I could. And <laughs> at first, Elizabeth East, like she's playing with China dolls. So I thought she was from China. But all of the goddesses I was researching have a lot more benevolence than evil. I think she's most likely West African because Nan Melda had such a connection and knew what to Mm -hmm. do. So that's my theory there. But again, we don't have contextual evidence for this. This is just me spiraling like a crazy (laughs) person. But I think I, I loved the fact of this ambiguous, red cloaked, female, unkillable deity thing, demon, that has so much power connected to this key in Florida and how she's able to influence and manipulate families and people through this give and take birth, death, life cycle. I will give you the power to create, but you will sacrifice to me. Like I want that power Mm -hmm. and I will take what I gave you back if you don't do what I and so you could go I went down that route of like what if this is a crazy dark goddess who had Edgar in her palms from moment one and the whole novel is just her fists closing around him contextually I don't know if we have evidence for that but she was so compelling to me she's so Mm -hmm. mysterious and strong and influential i i love it and i think it's she's one of the reasons i love this novel so much because i really do nerd out on the possibilities of what she could be yeah that's so fun because we we don't like i think like like i said last week i think we get one good like actual look at her like once one time um and and it's just the, the the language used there is so ambiguous and is like d- human shaped but definitely not human and not like what does that mean what does that mean how how right. does that work and yeah she's unkillable right like so, like the best we can do is drown her to sleep you can't like dr- drowning in any other living thing means death but to this thing it's just sleep it, it's never ever going to go away like the the implication that even even this thing where they they put her inside a flashlight inside a silver thing inside of a <laughs> freshwater lake at the bottom of a chasm it, it's, it's she's gonna get out eventually this is just this is just a, it's only a matter of time and hopefully it'll last a little bit longer this time that is so fascinating especially when we take that central idea and then marry it with this exploration of creation and art um and and like that becomes really really interesting and then and the thing matt and i talked about last week which is like a a a metaphor for addiction or for drugs of some sort which which i thought we had stumbled upon something brilliant and then we got some comments (laughs) from people that was like uh yeah that i thought that was obvious i was like oh okay (laughs) never mind um but no no i I agree with you it's such a a fascinating uh, unknown and and i like i I, to be honest with you i hadn't even really thought in detail about like why a woman um but you're right that's really fascinating because that you start to look at all the women in edgar's life and how how so much of this book hinges on his relationships with all the different women in his life including including uh, percy herself and that that becomes really interesting Mm mm-hmm I think that was one thing that that I toward the end of of our coverage we were like I I think I I was like well you know next week is the last week so we're we're gonna have to find out what it is that Percy wants because you gotta you gotta know you gotta find out what the monster wants like you, like and and we didn't really and and I found that I didn't mind that but mm-hmm. by the end I, I was like it's a, it's a monster it, it's a it's a demon it's it it looks covetously upon mankind and there's something that it wants from us maybe it just it, but it, it doesn't seem to have much of a plan it doesn't seem <laughs> it, and, and honestly like it doesn't seem very, very capable of forethought like it just it seems like vengeful and angry and uh, uh and and that felt that felt fine that felt satisfying at how everything played out yeah i agree i agree I love her. She's great. Uh, what about the other uh, uh, villainess of this book named Pam? 
How do you, how oh do you feel? How do you feel about Pam Kim? Because uh, obviously we're on two different sides of the spectrum. Where Matt thinks she's uh, the devil incarnate, and I think she's perfect <laughs> and never did anything wrong. Uh, so, uh-huh. so where where do you land? What what do you think about Pam? I loved your guys's coverage on Pam. Um, <laughs> so the first two times I read this book, Pam was very completely innocuous for me. Like, well, <laughs> there she is in the background. This read through, I don't know what happened. It could have been because I was hormonally compromised when I read the book. And I tried to, I tried to like rationalize that. Like, why are you getting mad at Pam? Maybe you're just, she, there's no reason to be this angry. Like, stop. (laughs) Who cares? I was so, oh my God, I am so mad at Pam. This third (laughs) read through, I just found it. I, I, I don't know what happened. Like, I don't know. I could not, (laughs) I'm just like, it was so weird, you guys. I was very irritated with Pam this time and I felt everything she was complaining about. I was like, he almost died. Could you couldn't, I mean, (laughs) he could, he, oh, he choked you with one arm. Really? So, I I mean, (laughs) that's terrible. I should never have thought those things, but I did this time. I don't know why. So I think there are moments when Pam's like, okay, whatever, but, or maybe it could have been because I read the book along with the audiobook. So John Slattery does a really good job. And maybe he just made her sound bitchier than normal. And maybe, <laughs> maybe that influenced it. Um, the part where she and Edgar are having a fight because he knows about, uh, is it Tom or Tom mm-hmm. Riley? Yeah. Yeah. And he's trying to save Tom and blah, blah, blah. She has such a wretched oh my god like she is she's a see you next tuesday straight up right (laughs) she is just behaving like such an irrational wretch of a person Mm -hmm. and i'm like what is wrong with you and so this time around pam was very problematic for me but i can't explain it i (laughs) i just was super reactive to the way she appeared in the text this time well i i think king wants you to feel complicated things about Pam. By the way, just par- parenthetically, like one of the joys of Stephen King is that he invites you to think horrible thoughts. So <laughs> so the fact that you think like it was just a little mild choking, Pam, get over it. <laughs> it's it he, he totally wants you to think that. Like he he want he he's putting you firmly in Edgar's point of view and and you're and you're in the position of this guy who's been through this horrible ordeal, literally brain damaged, didn't know what he was doing, probably thought he was fighting off a tiger or something. Like like who knows, right? There's there's and but then you look at it from her perspective, which you're, you're not inclined to because you're reading it from his perspective. It's like this large man tried to choke me, and it was scary. Um, uh, so so like th- that's where the complexity comes in is like you you start off very predisposed against her because it's just like from the beginning it's like she's totally unreasonable she dumps him for reasons that he doesn't understand while he's recovering from this horrible accident what a psycho and then like we <laughs> gradually understand like okay well she's unpleasant but sort of has her justifications uh as we as we go along um and there's there's some fun ambiguity which never really quite resolved, which I kind of like that it's like, was Edgar like a massive asshole? His like <laughs> their whole marriage, like probably actually. So yeah, um, yeah again, it, it, that's a really interesting thing that the book does, or I guess in this case doesn't do right. It is is it, it does feel, and, and I, I can't remember if I said this on the episodes already, but. I have never thought about Pam as much as I did <laughs> while reading this book with you, Same. Matt. Same. Like I, I just. I just read her and and I think I was like, oh, that's annoying. And then like, because ultimately she's not a key player in in the actual plot events of the book, or at least the the climax of of the book. As you said, so much of the stuff between Edgar and Pam is unresolved and goes unresolved. And like, you know, we, we think that perhaps this is a book about them, about him, about their marriage. It's not. And, and, and we get to this, this moment of, of perhaps, reconciliation and then horrible events happen and that is immediately dashed and gone um so we we don't get any of that but yeah i mean it, it's so interesting because i do think on this close read it's all there all the subtext is there like there's stuff like we talked about like what who who was edgar at the beginning of this book we never really learn and and i think it, it, you you were absolutely okay and and 
fine in, in asking those questions when we were going through that stuff because it seems like it's setting up for some sort of reveal or or closer examination of who this person is, but it doesn't pay off in that way because that's not that's not what the type of book it is. And I don't like. I guess like you, a person could look at that and be like, ah, that's a flaw in the writing is that, is that we have these things that, that feel so clearly set up in the beginning that are going to pay off in, in a way. And then they just never do. Um, mm. I, I guess you could say that. I, I think it, it works like, cause ultimately that's not what the story we're telling is, but it does bring <clears throat> complexity and, and breath to the world. Um, in, in an interesting way it makes these characters feel more real that like because because sometimes you're just not going to get resolutions well like, like like i mean he, he writes his book sometimes very naturalistic in just that like this is a story we have a plot and things are going to happen but just because it's a story doesn't mean every character is going to get a completed arc or resolution with every other character and yeah the the edgar pam stuff is really something that gets no resolution um they just the, the, it's just uh, the, the bad stuff happens and she's gone um that's, <laughs> that was always going to be pam right like yeah well f- for the record i think where i landed on the all the sort of subtext about edgar and edgar's past is that we we kind of got our answer it just wasn't as firm as i wanted it to be and and that's f- fine like mm-hmm. i because you know we uh kim was talking a minute ago about how it's like this very slow paced book it's like it's more like hearts in Atlantis than it is like desperation. Like it's this character study. It's very slow. It's, it's like twice as long as hearts in Atlantis while co- like basically covering less plot, like plot wise. Um, and so you're spending tons of time just dwelling in, in Edgar and his thoughts and his like relatively mundane things. So, so I think, I think we absorb what we're meant to absorb from just living in his point of view and 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 they're never I, I think i was just expecting the wrong thing and expecting there to be some moment where it was like just a, a you know crystal clear the book telling you the answer to some of these things i, I think i was just kind of in the wrong book in, in, headspace wise um yeah but, but i do feel the book kind of like gestures that that this that is that book and the, like that's why you that's why you went there i think um but it just it just goes a different direction ultimately. Yeah, I I, I mean I'm I'm partial to that because that that I don't, I don't want to think I was totally off base. Like it does feel like this gothic, um, uh, uh, horror not like it's a gothic horror novel, right? And you kind of expect certain things of that, and you expect there to be like dramatic revelations. And it's not like we got no dramatic revelations, but um, we didn't get the ones that I was expecting. But that's mm-hmm. okay. You sometimes you're just off base yeah. about what the book is doing. So we kind of we were on the the topic of of why this book is underrated, and then I I took us another direction. Sorry, everyone, <laughs> I, I'm I'm notorious for that. Um, I, I did want to kind of posit my central question with this was I understood this to be an underrated book, and then like when we prepared for the show, every one of our listeners was like, "No, I love this book. What are you talking about? I'm so excited you're covering this book. This book is awesome." And I was like, "Wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense." And, and I, I, I thought about this for a long time. Basically, the entire time we were doing the book, I was like, why does everyone think of this as an underrated book? But then literally everyone that listens to our show is in love with this book. And and I, I think this is just like kind of a, a selection bias a little bit here, because here's what I think why we love this book and why maybe the, the general populace doesn't love this book. We're dorks. And <laughs> we we really like analyzing and thinking about the act of creation of stories of art of anything we love that stuff and and i would wager to say the type of person that's going to listen to a podcast that takes 20 hours to cover in minute detail a, a, a book is probably that type of person too so like i just feel like everyone that's probably listening to the show and us the people that make the show uh, matt and i who have who have uh, devoted our free time to talking about books and you kim who who have who've made it your life's work and also devoted your free time to, to doing <laughs> yeah. that um are just like just much more inclined to to be on this book's exact wavelength and and so we probably are a bad overall representation of like (laughs) the reading public at large with this kind of stuff. 
Is that is that crazy? I don't know. It's not. It works. I I also think there are so many king heavy hitters that this guy just gets lost in the shadows. Yeah, Duma true, really true. just falls through the cracks with all the powerhouse other titles that get the airwaves. I mean, there's so many. And so Duma is a very special, unique little snowflake that is so rich and deep, but because of the other things that have been mentioned about, it just doesn't get the spotlight because everybody else is taking said spotlight. So it's just in the back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. It's also in the middle of a, a decade that is not largely considered to be King's best. And so like there were probably like when you think about the 2000s and Stephen King, your mind isn't probably immediately going to, oh, that was when he was firing on all cylinders. That's you go, ah, there's a lot of mixed stuff in there um you know there's a lot of books in there that i absolutely love from a buick eight it's a, it's a novel i i cherish but that's one that i totally understand why people don't like it like i i get it 100 percent um so yeah it, it's it's very easy to get lost in a shuffle especially in in a decade that is not largely considered uh, his best i think that makes sense um, so I wanted to talk about the how to draw a picture sections of of the novel, which are, are some of my favorite just like structural devices. We talked about this a lot on the show, but I'm curious what you think about them, Kim. So I, I did do my homework, by the way, and I, I grabbed the first sentence of all 12 of them, um, which I think when you lay them all out, they just paint a perfect picture of um, of what of what it's like to create a story like ultimately like here i'll just i'll share them i'll share them so you can see them all up that did not come through at all right um (laughs) that's terrible (laughs) i can read that you Um, want me to read it out loud scott so we can all yeah yeah you just go through that that's fine so yeah I'll, i'll say the number so one start with a blank surface two remember that the truth is in the details three stay hungry Four, start with what you know, then reinvent it. Five, don't be afraid to experiment. Find your muse and let her lead you. Six, keep your focus. Seven, remember that seeing is believing puts the cart before the horse. Eight, be brave. Nine, look for the picture inside the picture. Ten, be prepared to see it all. Eleven, don't quit until the picture is complete. And twelve, know when you're finished and when you are, put your pencil or your paintbrush down. Um, So like, that's like, I think if you read on writing, like that is essentially the advice he wrote in that, not in that, um, nonfiction novel put in here and just, he, he wrapped a story around it. Um, and I think that's so cool. I don't know, like hearing those read back, Kim, like what, what's kind of your reaction to those? Oh, they're so beautiful. They're so beautiful because those intervals, when you first read Duma Key, you're like, what's going on? There's a lot of Mm -hmm. mystery surrounding them. And then you have this different narrative voice, this young child, and you don't quite know it's Elizabeth Eastlake quite yet. And then when you go through it a second time and you know what you know, you're like, oh, this person is drawing herself back into life, which is exactly what Edgar did through creation, through art. She's coming back to the world again. And it can be from injury or it could be from any other big cataclysmic life event that knocks you off your horse. And step by step, little by little, through creation, through art, you're coming back to yourself or a new version of yourself. So it's really profound. It's really rich and deep and when they're all together like that it's so beautiful it's mm-hmm. so special yeah i i agree I, that's like i realized very early on that i really wanted to when this whole thing was done just lay them all out like that in, in a list like that and just see them all and, and I, I i'm so glad it had the effect on me and and on y'all that that i figured it would because I, I, part of me wonders if like you know he wrote on writing and that was one he was writing before the accident. He finished it up after the accident. And then like, I wonder if <laughs> years later, someone was like, oh, this was a really great book, Stephen. But I-, I wish you had like made it into a narrative. Like that would have been so you to like take writing advice and make it into a narrative. And he's like, oh, and that's <laughs> one of like, I-, I-, I always wonder like, what are the, the origin points of, of the stories he writes? You know, like what is, what is the first idea that becomes 
the 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 core part of the book that is then spiraled out into so many different things as he takes ideas and marries them together and and I love the idea of like I'm going to write a book about writing but this time instead of being a nonfiction book I'm going to write a story about writing um, but I'm not going to make it about writing because I, I don't want that's too easy I'm going to make it about drawing because I don't know how to <laughs> do that and, <laughs> and I'm gonna I'm gonna relate those two things together and I'm going to explore that idea um, and 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 learn something new while I'm doing it and and I think that's that's really cool I, I love I love every every bit of these I love you know yeah. I I love the the be prepared to see it all. Like one one of the things, my favorite things about this this book is how magical and terrifying the act of creation can be. That just this like it it, it is so overwhelming sometimes. You know, when you're you're sitting down and 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 breathing life into a world, and it feels powerful, it feels fulfilling, but it also feels terrifying. And that is something that I think King captured perfectly in this book. It, mm-hmm. It's so it's so great to see it like this. It it hit me really hard this third read through because after I finished my MFA, I I've taken like a seven year break. And it's because of that. It's because of getting stuck and life getting in the way. And so I really liked how Elizabeth Eastlake says, well, if you can't draw or if you can't paint, if you can't do the art, then you better support those who can, mm-hmm. which is what I do. <laughs> and so um so when you have these little snippets, these vignettes on the how to draw a picture, it's like it's speaking very close <laughs> to to anybody who struggles to create, which is the other side of it. Yes, the act of it is daunting, but those who really want to but can't, it's also very powerful. Yeah, yeah. Like and and I think it also it to me, you know, as King has, has gotten later in his career, I think he's, he's, he's always, he's always wanted to help teach and he's always been a teacher, right? Like he was literally a teacher. Um, but as he's moving into this kind of second half of his life and second half of his career, I feel like he's, he's taking on that mantle even more. And this book is, is almost a way of teaching the, these ideas. And it's something he's still doing today. Like I, I, <laughs> I saw that our, our, our mutual friend on the talking scared podcast, this was like tweeting today about a, a struggle with writing he's having and Stephen King f- f- retweets it. And is like, no, 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 here's what you do. Here's how you just focus on the story. Don't worry about the words. They'll come. And it's just like, holy, <laughs> holy shit. What that must be like uh, to just be sitting there. And then <laughs> I died yesterday reading those tweets. Like I just was so happy for Neil. Yeah, but I was yeah. so happy for all of us because mm-hmm. I just feel like any podcaster or any King fan, it's like, oh my god, it's yeah. like God talking to you. <laughs> like, wow, wow, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's wonderful that he does that kind of stuff. Yeah, so- social media is awful, but occasionally it can be amazing. <laughs> that's, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's Grandpa definitely King. One of, yeah, it's one of the good things. You know, there there's certain things that jump out to me on this on this how to draw a picture stuff. Um, now that we're kind of looking back at it, right? Um, so, uh, speaking of of us being geeks who were super obsessed with the process, I actually start like started over listening to on writing like immediately after finishing this book because I was like. These two, like I, we kept, we kept mentioning it. These two things are so connected. And just before we sat down, I finished the part where his family has an intervention on him, and he agrees to stop drinking and doing drugs. And for a while, he thinks, "Well, now I'm, I, I just have to accept that I'm going to be a mediocre writer for the rest of my life, and I'll accept that because I, I, I want to have a, my family and I want to have the people I love around me." And then he realizes that that was bullshit and you don't actually have to be an alcoholic wreck to be a creative person. And this is just a sort of romantic fiction that we all culturally carry around that, and, and it's nonsense. And and I, I'm just saying that because like looking at this when he says, you know, let, find your muse and let her lead you. It's like this make, this really makes it connect even more this idea that Percy is this alluring source of, of creative power that Edgar thinks that he he needs that he's he's feeding off of and then he you know goes and eats raw hamburger meat um <laughs> th- that connection like suddenly felt a lot more vivid after after especially listening to on writing um I think that's definitely there 
Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. Um, that, that idea that, yeah, like find your muse and let her lead you. Like the, the, the illusion that this muse is a substance or something that's going to elevate you or make like, I, I love what you said about the, the meat. Cause I think that's something I don't think we adequately like talked about on our show was this, this very clear, very disturbing reality that every time he channels Percy specifically to do any act of creation, he becomes ravenous to the point where he's basically turning into an animal. Mm -hmm. And that, I mean, that is, that is pretty clear imagery, right? That like when you are, when you are channeling this power, when you are uh, attaching yourself to this thing, it is, it is, it is breaking down your, your humanity and Mm -hmm. turning you animalistic. And, and this is the, this is the result of it. I think that's, that's great. And I'm glad you reminded me of that because I hadn't like, it just, it just, as, as the novel goes on, you, you just get used to it. You get used to, Oh, he paints and then he's really, really hungry. And you forget that the first act of that after he strangled the dog um, was essentially raw hamburger meat Mm -hmm. that he was eating. Um, Yeah. And, and I may be messing up the metaphysics of this, but it's like the most the most impressive supernatural thing that he does is wiping out the island, which he does after Percy is already put away. So it's like he he didn't need Percy, actually. Yeah. That was just that, him the whole time. That's my favorite part. And yeah, I don't think we mentioned that. I, I meant to mention that last week, but but yeah, like th- that is that is def- the definitive answer on where this power was coming from, right? Mm-hmm. Like, was it coming from Percy or was it coming from Edgar? Percy's asleep. She's drowned. She's at the bottom of a lake. Um, this is this all was coming from Edgar, and it was just an illusion. It was just a a, a, a a it was a fake that it was coming from this other power. That it was always from him, and that's I think ultimately the, the message the king has that lines up exactly with what you just said. This idea of like, oh, now I've given up alcohol. I'm going to be a mediocre writer. It's like no, no, it wasn't coming from that. It was never coming from that. You just thought it was. It was always inside you, and you just have to find a way to tap into that again. And maybe it was easier for you at that phase in your life to tap into that when you were the under. The the influence of something but that doesn't mean it's the only way forward that's yeah. such a revelation <laughs> <It's> so <laughs> huge yeah yeah i love it yeah that's such a good book <laughs> it is <laughs> it's i'm so, so happy you guys like it oh my god gothic with all capital g all caps mm-hmm. <laughs> let's i think that's a good thing to talk about kim because like i i i have to say i am not like super well versed in gothic literature like myself i've obviously read like the big ones um how, what, how are you with with gothic literature is that just something you generally really love have you read a lot of of gothic stories how does this Why, kind yes, of fit sir. in the, the pantheon <laughs> of of gothic literature yeah, I uh being an English major, that was the stuff I gravitated towards because I'm not a Brit lit fan. Sorry, mm-hmm. everybody out there who's from the UK. Um, because I'm, you know, a passionate person and Brit lit is a lot of people holding in their feelings until they die and no one said anything <laughs> and everyone's miserable and that makes me want to die. I can't handle it. But with the, with <laughs> with gothic novels, I always tell my students to simplify it, setting and secrets. The setting is everything, and this, there are secrets within that setting that are going to impact our present day characters. And so, once they can wrap their head around that, they're paying attention to the setting, and everything that's going around these characters is from that root of setting and secrets. So, Duma is the coolest place. Like, this is, it's this isolated, mysterious slice of beach that's owned by this family with all of these mysterious tragedies surrounding them. And there's only one remaining, um, the matriarch of the East Lake family is the only one left. It's just so rich and deep. And so all of those secrets, the fact that we have two herons roosts and <laughs> it's all just dilapidated and, oh man, what they find, the, the climactic, secrets that are revealed in the end it's just like this is the most gothic thing ever just because (laughs) the setting is the star the setting is what consistently gives and gives and gives and that's the mystery we're following Mm -hmm. plus all the props surrounding said setting the basket the harpoon gun all of the it's it's all at the root in the setting and so i love gothic novels so much this reminded me a lot of rebecca which 
still mm-hmm. slaps to this day. If you guys <laughs> check out Rebecca, it's a page turner from Daphne du Maurier that takes place in a mansion called Manderley. And so Manderley is the setting with all the secrets. <laughs> this this was King flexing those gothic mu- muscles so well. He just, it, this is a home run. This is a home run gothic novel. And I felt when I first read it, I'm like, oh, I'm in school. This feels like school. This is such a rich, deep gothic text where you can identify it everywhere. This feels like something that we would study in school. That's great. Yeah, I mean, I, I think... Uh, again, I, I don't know a lot about Gothic literature, obviously, but I mean, it just feels like everything I do know about it, it's so evident here that like, if you're wanting to teach someone what Gothic literature is without having them read novels that came out a uh, hundred years ago or more, <laughs> like this is like the perfect example of it, right? I think it just, it just fits so well. It's like th- this modern, I loved that w- while we were exploring that, we found that like Florida Gothic is like a term that exists. Like that's the thing that exists. Um, and it's so, so evident <laughs> and, and wonderful here. Um, yeah, I, I need to read. Rebecca has like been on my list forever and I, I really don't have an excuse anymore. I, I do think he's playing with the unexpected nature of having like a, a gothic novel on a sunny beach, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's part of the fun of, of this book for him and, and why, mm-hmm. why he went with this concept is like yeah, everything about it is gothic except like the, the, the nature of the setting itself. And maybe, maybe that's, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is, off base but like this might actually make it hard to adapt to film because it's like you're trying to have like a creepy gothic like m- music playing and it's like and the, and the <laughs> camera is sweeping in over a beautiful beach and with the palm trees and sunset and it's like it, it just clashes visually i don't know i'm, I'm probably probably wrong but i feel like uh, the, 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 cor- the correct director could nail that though that look though and yeah. and and kind of the contrast of those ideas would I feel like be catnip to a to a director that loves that kind of thing? That I mean, still remains one of the biggest questions I have about this whole thing is why has no one tried to adapt this yet? Like it just the the more I think about it, the more absolutely convinced I am that this is one of those stories that would just work incredibly well in another for, in, in the visual format it just feels like it's built for it um and it just it, i mean maybe it's the same reason that we talked about it's it's all the reasons why it's underrated and underappreciated that no one's ever thought hey well, let's do this one like on the or list of like when you get all the all the big working directors out there and they're let's say you know you can adapt a stephen king thing um like i just feel like doom is probably going to be pretty low on their list of things they want to direct but it shouldn't be. It really shouldn't be. Yeah. It would be so beautiful. Can you imagine if you got yeah. a, just the coolest painters and artists and they bring all of these things to life on mm-hmm. these huge canvases and we find the perfect beach location and we build Big Pink? Like, come on, I'm dying. Yeah. Like, yeah. it would be exceptional. It would be incredible. You could do fun things with the visual idea too. Like, you could have the paintings... Like I'm, I'm thinking about how there's like screaming faces in the wake of the ship, and it's like you could totally do that where you have several versions of that painting, and and you you only and like they're similar enough that just casually watching the movie you can't tell that they're different, and then it's like you you, you know you cut to it at the, and, and Elizabeth is pointing these things out, and you're like holy shit, there's faces, <laughs> um, like I, I I can imagine that being incredibly effective. Somebody should do this. I, I don't know why it hasn't been done yet. Um, yeah. And, and I was, it was one of those things when like when it blew up and everyone was going crazy with King adaptations, I was like just waiting for it. I'm like, surely one of these days, any, any minute now, someone is going to announce that we're, we've optioned to do a key film. Um, and, and here we go. But nothing, nothing. When it happens, I will weep tears of joy. <laughs> but I personally think, we need to call up Alfonso Cuaron, that director. I don't know if you ever saw the film. Well, he's he's an amazing director, but he did a film in 1998 that was a Great Expectations redo or a remake mm. and takes place in Florida. Finn, which is the main character of the Dickens novel, is an artist. And so the paintings are incredible. I think if you guys watch Great Expectations, it's very Duma Key-esque. And I think we need to tag him in a tweet and beg and 
<laughs> and say, you've kind of already done it. Um, this would just be a little bit grander scale, but you've already done a movie about art and beach and yeah, make it That's happen. awesome. Yeah. I love Coro and I have not seen his, his great expectations. Um, he, he has the, the distinct uh, honor of being the, the only good director in the Harry Potter series. Like his Harry Potter was the only one that looks remotely good. And it looks, so, and, and it's cool because not only does his look better than any of the other ones, but like the choices he made as far as what the sets look like and what the costumes look like. And just the whole look of the series from the third movie on was all because of him. And like, it's, he's, he's a fantastic director. Um, I'm a Children huge of Men, fan. Love it. Gravity. Oh my God. Gravity. Was, huge I fan. Loved gravity. Incredible. And he loves the color green. So in mm. two of his films, Great Expectations being one of them, and then A Little Princess is an, the other one, the color green is like a character. It's in every frame. It's so cool. And we got a lot of red in Doom a Key. And I'm like, you can do this. You've already done it with green. Just just reverse it. Just do it. Yeah, I don't even I'm trying to see like what he's working on right now. I mean, he had he had Roma that came out gosh, six years ago now, which was kind of like his autobiographical film. Um, and I, he hasn't done anything since then. So he to get on it. <laughs> Somebody out there needs to get on it. I am desperate. I am yeah. begging. Like this is the richest, most luxurious visual text you could ask for. It, it, you don't even have to have actors speaking lines. Just show us the paintings. <laughs> like, <laughs> just show us the beach and paintings, and we'll be satisfied. Yeah, we. I mean, we had a bunch of listeners throughout the course of this the show, like using the AI art generator thing just to just to give us some looks at what the stuff might look like. And like, so I mean, those were cool. I'm just like imagining what a gifted artist and 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 director and whatever could could bring to this because like those looked cool. And it's like, wow, look, if someone like spends time and creates it like in 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 a cinematic quality. Ugh, yeah, yeah, it needs to happen. Yeah, that's the the book really reactivated my joy of like visual art. Like I I spent so much time over the last however many weeks this has been on art. Like I I got a I got an easel and a and a giant <laughs> sketch pad and I've been like drawing and and like painting just just because of this book. And it's like <sighs> And and like like looking up like who are the best painters in 2024, and then looking at their paintings and be, be, partly as a matter of like research for this for these conversations because it's like we, we've had a lot of conversations about like the art world and, and the conversation around art, and so I was like I want to know one percent more of what I'm talking about by actually looking at like what what passes for 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 great art these days. Anyway, just um it's delightful and and yes adapting it to a visual medium seems obvious to to belabor the point um let's start the campaign all right how do how do we do this <laughs> right um i good question but i think this is a start we just have to rally the troops we have to give as much spotlight on duma as possible and mm -hmm. Everybody's doing such a good job at that because, yeah, we, we got to do it. We Maybe somebody can ask Flanagan when he's done with Roland. <laughs> hey, when you take a break, can you adapt this, please? <laughs> yeah. So I was I was I, I was just thinking that but I don't want like the problem is my answer to everything is always, oh, Flanagan should do it. Um, and obviously, <laughs> he can't do everything. <laughs> right. But um, I was looking and it looks like in 2019, he did sell the rights uh, to someone and i guess the project stalled um but it was taylor hackford was in talks oh, to direct the adaptation okay. of this so um maybe we can tweet him and ask about that <laughs> yeah. i mean it was i guess five years ago now so the project is definitely like there's so so many so many post it projects just didn't ever actually go anywhere but uh yeah oh well, well. if there was a totally grassroots <laughs> not organized by anyone campaign to showing interest just showing interest yeah, yeah. and you know that's the kind of thing that makes uh studios say yeah let's throw some money at this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think i think the reality is they're just like 
the 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 movie landscape we we live in right now is so tumultuous and uncertain that like nobody wants to spend money on anything and like uh, Stephen King's name will always go far right uh but this is one of his less known stories and so it makes it really difficult yeah but hopefully we'll see once once Flanagan finishes the Dark Tower and it uh it reinvigorates the Stephen King brand anything could happen I know it's going to be a huge renaissance. I, I'm really excited for it. I think it'll be awesome. So, Me too. I think we'll see the day, guys. I think we'll see <laughs> it with our eyes, and it'll be a beautiful day at that. <laughs> mm-hmm. All right. We got a question um, in our mailbag that we'll get to in a bit that was basically like, um, are you going to – if if you end the show, are you going to start up the show again when adaptations of the, of the stuff you've covered come out? Uh, and – and if it's Dumaki, the answer is 100%. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else either of y'all wanted to, to hit on Dumaki uh, before we wrap this up? Uh, I, I, I love this conversation. This is great. It's exactly how I wanted it to go. Um, we didn't talk much about uh, some of the other characters. Like we, we hit the, the big ones like Pam, um, but we didn't talk much about Ilsa and, and Elizabeth as characters. Anything to say about them, uh, Kim or Matt? Um, I love the female symbols in this book. And I think that there's so many girls in this book. Like mm-hmm. when we look at it, there's a lot of females and uh, it's kind of why I love that Percy is female because we've got this dark feminine, this very ominous, foreboding, dark feminine presence. And yet you have Elizabeth Eastlake who we see as a child in the 20s, her life is pretty mysterious because she never admits to being a talented artist. She kind of just kept that secret, probably because she associated it with Percy. She knew by that point that her art and the talent was attached to Percy somehow. I, I'm assuming, I don't know if we have evidence in the text to support that. But And then Ilsa and her sister Melinda, they're, they're sweet. And we've got the two sisters, Tessie and Lolo or Tessie and Lola, I forget. But yeah, the two sisters that kind of parallel each other, I, it, even though those are spooky sisters, I, I just love all the females in this story and how Ilsa is so sweet and so good. And of course, she's, you know, I think Percy requires that femicide. It's just a theory. Mm-hmm. I think that that's why Elizabeth Eastlake tried, when she was Copus Mentis, tried to warn Edgar at the beginning of the novel, Dumaki is not a good place for daughters. Because she saw what happened to her own sisters. And I think by that point, she had, she saw Percy. She knew what, what this place was all about and that everybody was under the thumb of this demonic presence. But I love the greater symbols of feminine lightness, sweetness, goodness that give Edgar a lot of inspiration. All those just beauty. This novel, even though it's dark and foreboding, has so much beauty in it. It's so beautiful. And Mm -hmm. the women are a part of that. And it's really cool to look at each one of them. Yeah, th- that's great. I hadn't thought about it until you said it that way. But like, it, it is like the, the feminine archetypes are, are laid out here almost. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't remember the full list of them off the top of my head. But I mean, you've you've got a very old woman. You've yep. got a, a sort of a sort of maiden persona with Elsa. Mm-hmm. Um, you've you've got a, a mother in, in the form of Pam, um, and then like you know the the. <laughs> whatever you whatever you want to call it the the dark feminine i think is a great descriptor for for percy um yeah i'm, I'm I, I think that's it's interesting I, I was sitting here while we've been talking this whole time i've been trying to figure out like what what is pam's like function it's like she she's a big part of the story like she, this isn't like oh yeah and then also edgar has an ex-wife it's like no she 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 recurs in the story she the story like starts and ends with her almost like it's and i'm I'm still i'm a little i I was hoping i could like come up with something brilliant while we were talking and have just like (laughs) pam is like a inverse percy or something it's like no i don't i don't think that's really it it's but it's like i I think it might have more to do with kind of what you just said it's like these are the archetypes and pam is one of the archetypes and that's that's the and what we're doing with that i I don't quite have a thesis nailed down but you you've given me a lot to think about there yeah i mean i i don't think i've ever really thought about it this way because 
like they're, they're the, the characters that Edgar is interacting with on a daily basis throughout the course of the novel are men, right? It's Wireman and Jack primarily, but like women are everywhere. Mm-hmm. Like, like uh, Elizabeth and her, her sisters, it was all women. Um, Edgar's children are both like Edgar lived in a household where he was with three women, his wife and, and, and two daughters. Um, and then Elizabeth herself. And yeah, it's just like, it, it's not something Iyer. that like, yeah, yeah. Mary Iyer, you're absolutely right. It's not something that like actually like consciously occurred to me while you're going through the novel. But like when you, when you put it, when you shine a light on it in that way, it's like, oh yeah, this was absolutely intentional. And we're, and like, we're, we're doing something very specific with exploring the different types of femininity and, and the way Edgar interacts with them um, and the way they interact with each other. And, and yeah, this is really interesting stuff that I had never thought about before. <laughs> Isn't it huge? Yeah. I, I went nuts, guys. Because, yeah. yeah, there are so many archetypes, so many stages of womanhood. And yet Percy is at the core and it's like this rotten, dark, scary. And you're like, what does that mean? So <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, man. Do you guys – I know. Do you guys have a favorite work of art in Duma? Um, I have to think about that. I mean, like, I, I feel like the one that is described the most evocatively to me is Wireman Looks West. Um, like that is the one that like, when I, like, I think, I think we did the show is like, this is the one I want to see like your girl and the girl and ship series. Of course. Like I want to see, I want to see like the horror and, and discomfort that this painting creates while also just being a picture of a girl in a rowboat looking at a ship. Um, but, but yeah, Wireman looks West. Like it just like, beca- because of like the complicated nature of how he like draw and cuts out the piece and then, and then, puts the piece onto the canvas and like that whole deal. Like, I just really, really want to see that. So that g- generally might be my, my answer, but I, I just to give a different answer, I'll, I'll say, I forget the name of it. It's the one, it, it's the pencil sketch of Pam and, and, you know, her two lovers sort of on opposite sides and the way it's described, see, it's been so long since we read that part that I, I might be getting this wrong. But like the, my recollection is that it's described as this like very sparse sort of stark pencil drawing. Yeah. Um, which and I just personally like sparse, stark pencil sketches anyway. That's just like <laughs> a thing that I like. So I'm going to go with that one. Um, and, and also it's um, the, like the the subject matter, you know, the, the, the subject matter being de- depicted is so... Um, you, you imagine that if you actually saw that in a, in a museum gallery, it, it, you would be like, what's going on here? This, this is telling a story, you know? Um, so I, I, I like yeah. that one a lot. That's a good answer. How about you, Kim? What's yours? Very nice. Uh, I'm super obsessed with girl and ship, of course, but I really like the tennis ball one that he mm. did when Elsa comes to town and there's just all these tennis balls kind of floating and she's rowing towards something because I love surrealist stuff. And I love that we've got a lot of mention of Dali and Edward Hopper and Andrew Wyeth and all these people that I love that King mentions these painters. So we so the readers can go and look at their work. And and I also love that our book cover is covered in like the American hardcover has all these gorgeous illustrations and these vivid yeah. colors. It's such a media rich experience. It's so sensory. It's so cool. But um, yeah, tennis balls. I forget what it's called, but the, t- <laughs> the tennis ball one. Is it the end think- of the game? Yeah, that's, that's the end it. Of the game. That's yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. The end of the game. That's a good one. It, it's so great because he holds like why there are tennis balls. He holds that revelation for so long yeah. and, and it's like you, you almost to you where you forget about it it's like why did you draw this one with tennis balls that's weird yeah <laughs> don't worry about it yeah i i love man i just love that as a as a m- moment in writing where he's like ah we we saved the day we only lost a few unimportant people <laughs> and then he lo- <laughs> and then he sees the tennis balls and you don't even have to be told like what does that mean it's like we already know what that means and he knows yeah. what that means. And I love that because how Stephen King set that up in, in that way is a mystery to me, um, which makes me very happy. I love it when there are things that are a mystery to me. Cause it gives yeah, me it's to one think of those about. things where you're like, e- even after the reveal, you're still like, 
okay, but why tennis balls? <laughs> like, like it's just it, it, because, and it, the reason is because it's surreal. Like, yeah. like it's just okay. We're gonna just have this this random crate is gonna wash up on the shore right when you learn the news, and so there's just gonna be a bunch of tennis balls floating, and you 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 grabbed on to that in your with your future site or whatever. And I think it shows kind of the unwieldy nature of of creation that sometimes you'll just grab onto something that you don't fully understand and won't even fully understand until much later. And then you see, oh, that's where that came from. Like uh Kim, you you just got to interview John Langan. <laughs> uh, just I, th- I think the episode just came out last week. Um and I, I love that episode, but one of the things he was talking about in one of his stories was he wrote this Christmas story that was a reaction to something that happened with his father and he didn't even realize when he was writing it that that was a a reaction to an event that happened with his father and that's like how creation works and i think that's the tennis balls perfectly represent that you're just you're grabbing onto something and you're putting it in your work and you don't know why it's 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 there and and sometimes you never figure out why and sometimes it takes someone else pointing it out to make you realize why and like that's so cool and and like we talk i think one of the lines in this book is art is magic and and that's that's the way it's magic and the way it, you 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 channel something into the stuff that you might not be even conscious of yourself i, I love it I love yeah. it so much so good <laughs> would there be a part in the book that you guys would edit out if you could um wireman's death <laughs> <laughs> fair very fair I don't think that was quite the <laughs> <laughs> the type of of answer you've, you've given like. given me the eraser you've given me the uh dandelo eraser um hmm i i i mean i complained about this last week and got like a bunch of responses about like why <laughs> it was fine um there there's some stuff that happens in in the actual herons old herons roost stuff that feels a little clunky to me like i i guess the moments with the animals are cool um in that they they bring tension to the scene and we get to see how awesome wireman is but like i almost feel like that it's not needed like i feel like we understand the looming threat and and the time crunch they have and the stakes without having an alligator jump out of a pool and, and charge our, our people. And then like the, the payoff with the heron is, is really kind of anticlimactic because like we've, we mentioned the heron like six times before we actually see it as, as a threat. And then it's just immediately dispatched. And it's like, just, just stuff that like, it's not bad. It's just kind of, kind of clunky and, and a little weird. So I guess if I had to edit something, I would, I would probably maybe carve some of that stuff out and keep it focused on the revelation of the mystery and less on, uh, let's shoot a bird now. <laughs> yeah. That works. Yeah. This oh, is, from, go ahead. The, 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 sorry. Just like the, I, I agree with Scott. I mean, I, I, I certainly didn't dislike the ending but in this like slow paced meditative story that we got i don't think i needed like an action set piece there at the end i think it could have mm. just been like edgar is completely like devastated and he's gonna do what needs to be done and it's not really it's not really like like stakes wise you don't really care so much that there's like an alligator you're like well okay shoot the it's cool there's a desert eagle that desert eagle in a gothic setting that that's fun i'm glad we got to see that but <laughs> anyway I'm, I'm still unclear on like the actual like metaphysics of how percy is able to like take over animals like how how does that work and align with how her powers work i don't don't know ultimately this doesn't matter right like like (laughs) the ending works fine but yeah there's stuff like that where i'm just like i don't get that like why is that happening that way um and and i think like one of the 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 smartest things king does in the climax and and i love so much is that the final action sequence between wireman and jack and the zombies isn't actually on the page we just hear it through edgar like we don't actually get to see any of it and i love that because that's not like the focus of the moment that's there for just tension and 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 getting to see all that play out um we don't have to actually see the the battle we don't have to see him like pull the the spear gun and stab it like i I feel like that just doesn't 
align with the tone of the the, the climax itself um so so we get to hear it but not see it i think is great but yeah then like i don't know and i still think i still think jack's refusal to tell edgar <laughs> dwyerman his plan with the flashlight still doesn't make sense to me I, we had some listeners say it's oh because he doesn't want percy to find out what the plan is and i'm like yeah that makes sense but like what is she gonna do like, like <laughs> oh oh the flashlight huh well i'll send my attack um bird to come <laughs> steal your mag light real quick I, yeah i just i, I don't know like Great. I love the book. We've just spent the past hour and a half talking about how good the book is. Right. So like uh, uh, just just some clunkiness at the end there. I gotcha. What do you For think? Me, Kim? Yeah, um, it is the Tom Riley Pam phone call. I for whatever <laughs> reason that just annoyed me so much, guys. I don't know because we've got multiple phone calls. He's got a caller to say, "Hey, I need you to reach out to Tom. I'm afraid X Y Z. Just do it." She's like, "I don't know." And so that's what I. That's it's just Pam. Then it's the repeat call. Pam calling him back. I'm like, I'm I'm, I'm done. I don't like this. <laughs> I don't need this. And I understand understand that overall it's important to establish that he actually does save Tom's life and he has this kind of ability to see that oh Pam has a tattoo xyz <laughs> it is effective but it irritated me <laughs> this time around so I'm like you know I bet you anything if we chop this it'd be fine and we could just go to the candy brown stuff and just have the Tom Riley thing maybe come out later organically and it'd hmm. be fine. I don't know. But I do have one more question from my dad. I saw him this weekend. He's a huge Duma Key fan. And he's like, I need you to ask the – I need – I have a question about how – how does the old lady know to drown the statue? How does she know? And so in my reread, I'm like, I'm pretty sure it was Nan Melda, but I don't know if I missed something. But he's like, how does she know? How does she know? So that was from my dad. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's true. My, my understanding was it was Nan Melda's idea. She was the one that came up with the plan. And I think it has to do with what you talked about with the kind of the mystery of Percy and, and where she comes from that that Nan Melda through her culture seems to understand kind of the rules of, of this kind of magic and this kind of monster a little bit better than anyone else. I, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Well, just OK. So so no, I'm I'm not sure either, but like. Wasn't there this thing where they realized that if they had conversations like in fresh water, then yeah, she the, couldn't the only, hear them? The only place the only place they were safe from her was in the pool. Um I, so I think that that's a logical leap. That, yeah. Okay, if it's the pool, what is it about the pool? Oh, how is it different from any of the other water around here? Oh, it's the only fresh water. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think that makes sense. But yeah, I mean like the actual like the act of drowning would strip her of her powers, I think just comes from nan melda and i think it is a combination of that understanding and then yeah her her history with with or a, a basic understanding with these kind of entities i guess mm -hmm. yeah i i kind of clunky clunkily said that to my dad i just don't know if he was satisfied with that but because <laughs> because i think he was really hunting for more of like what percy is which is what we all want mm -hmm. And that's kind of why Duma is so cool because you're like, what are you? What are you? <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to me that to to be a bit meta, like so so much of this conversation and, and other conversations we've had about Duma Key specifically have been like, you know, I really wanted like a satisfying sort of cathartic sort of sense of closure about Element X, and we didn't really get that. Isn't that interesting? And then we've had that conversation like four different times. <laughs> about, about like like so many and i think that's like one thing he's doing with this book maybe is just like nope that's not how life is mm -hmm. and this you know again it's this slow paced character study it's it's a man looking back on his life and looking back on this horrible thing that happened to him and it's like you know what i didn't get the moment where I did the rocky run up the stairs of, of you know, after being totally rehabilitated. My my hip still hurts sometimes. Yeah. Folks, yeah. you know, there, there's that that's that's just not how it is. And I, I, I like that about the book. Like, I think that's one of the unique having read all these books, you know, over this project like that. That's the unique thing about this book is how often it leaves you frustrated in a way that feels very intentional. Yeah. And, and maybe that's part of the reason why it's it's an under loved Mm -hmm. uh, a book too because it doesn't give you 
the the type of things that a lot of people go to stories for. Um, I mean, I I think <laughs> once again, desperation is such a perfect foil for this novel because Mm -hmm. desperation is like all action it's like all we're gonna throw you in the middle of it and it's you're gonna go 100 miles an hour until the book is over and and my constant complaint throughout that entire episode was man i wish we could just spend some more time with these characters and just chill with them and learn about them for just a little bit and that's what this entire book is, is 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 really just getting to sit with these characters and learn about them and see them interact and and the joy that it brings you and the heartbreak that it brings you um so yeah i think uh that's that's great yeah i think it's a testament just to the skill of the writing that it, we we three people can have so many oh i wish they had done this in the book and yet still love the hell out of it like that's <laughs> isn't that awesome yeah. like yeah. that's so great all right well that is that's doom a key we did it <laughs> Now, uh, Matt, quickly draw a picture of a storm and wipe the the island. Okay. That's a good question. Kim, did he like delete the island at the end? Like, because that's something Matt and I were were trying to not necessarily in disagreement of, but but had different reads on it. Where like I always assumed that he just made a storm that was so big it basically just drowned Doom Key as a whole, and the key just ceases to exist as a place anymore. What was what was your take on it? Same. I do believe that that final note is him, like, if it is going to be one last drawing, one last utilization of this power, let's just wipe it away. It is Mm -hmm. the source of so much pain for me now. Like, I reflect on it with a lot of sadness, a little bit of melancholy and beauty, but mostly dread and sadness Mm -hmm. for what happened to me there. I do feel that he wipes it out, which is a little slightly upsetting because Wireman gave the everything to the East Lake family. So right. granted they are very financially well buffered, so they should be okay. But like, dang, I hope no one was hurt. God, there are people who live there, but yeah, I guess he was fed up at that point. So bye. <laughs> bye I, Duma. I did think it was very funny that, that that is like a, a beat at the very end of the novel that the East Lake family that as far as we know has not done anything wrong and is like there's they're, they're not like shitty people or anything they're just like ah, ha ha yeah I gave them the island and the herons roost and took all the 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 actual liquid assets ha 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 sucks for them it's like wait what did what did they do uh-huh. yeah hope they get yeah. out okay yeah yeah well also also the the Wireman's like so so nobody's gonna be hurt right and Edgar's like <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yeah sure it kind of made me feel how I felt about the end of it nobody goes and gets Eddie's body and I'm mm-hmm. really upset mm-hmm. about that like yeah. I I have a perma grudge uh, forever I'm like go get him um so I kind of have that like what do you mean can you tell can you call the East Lake can you call Heron's Roost please before you wipe out the island It'd be nice It'd be considerate Edgar but I think he's he's the hashtag over it uh-huh. <laughs> look if someone's on Duma Key at this point they're probably bad so it's fine Tis true. There is that. Especially if you drive around Palacio de Asesinos, you're <laughs> probably toxic zombie yeah. sludge pile. Mm-hmm. For sure. I'm so appreciative that you guys did this title. I loved your coverage on it. It just made my heart so happy. It This book needs love and spotlight, and I think you guys gave it that. So I'm so grateful and appreciative. Thank you so much. Well, that's very nice. Thank you. Yeah, it, w- it was an absolute joy. I, I loved this one. Um, e- even when I was making my little minor complaints about it, uh, this was this was one of the, my favorite books that we've covered for sure. Um, Matt, wh- I guess what it, I, I never got to ask you, like here sitting at week eight, a, a week removed from the end of the book. What are your what are your final thoughts on Doom McKee? So, I mean, I, I ended up I, I, I think I, it's like I enjoyed reading it the whole time I was reading it. And then I, it just made me feel sad when I finished it. So it's not like I'm like, <laughs> fuck this book. It, it's it's <laughs> like, that's not the vibe at all. In, in fact, this is one of the rare ones where I feel like a real urge to reread. And a part of that reason is because it was this slow paced character study. 
I think I would benefit from like re- redoing it, but in a shorter time frame. Like like mm-hmm. you know, just listening to it all the way through in a week or two. Because cer- certain things just pop into focus when you read that way. Like some sometimes, I'm gonna be honest. Like sometimes I think I'm like I I'll go on a on a on a you know musing, and I'm like, what are we trying to say with the? And it's like Matt, you're you're hyper fixating on what you just read and not realizing that it's just this really obvious through line over the last three weeks. And you just can't see it because it, because you're reading it too slowly, which is the flip side of like, well, we get to do a close reading this way or we get to do yeah. a closer reading. Um, so I'm not like it was, it was, it was fine. I just, I, th- I think certain things would click better for me if I just read it like, in a, like a normal person. Um, so I, and I feel, and I want to do that actually. Um, that's a good sign. I also think this one just rewards reread because the mystery is such a big part of it. And once you know the mystery, you can focus on the parts of the book that are are clearly like paying off the central themes and not focus on the parts of the book that are getting you to question what is happening here. And uh, like you, you can just you can distill down to the, the most important beats a little bit. Um, I, I think that that's true with most mystery stories, um, but I think especially this one for sure good point yeah yeah the secondary reads are so generous in what they give and i'm excited i'm i think it's a good sign that you want to read it again i think that it's you're haunted too matt yeah Yeah. (laughs) i am i am haunted by this yeah i I think i think that's um just yeah just, just along that line like one of the benefits of leaving things unresolved in a novel is that it it preys on you after you put it down um i i I, i'm just going to mention this because it's been on my mind anyway that um frank herbert ended dune in the middle of a paragraph and it's like what does that mean it it it, it clearly ends like it ends where it ends and it's like no if you it when i finished that book as a child i literally like turned the page and was like am i missing something because of the way it ends and then in interviews he's actually said that he did that on purpose to give you a feeling of well that well th- but then what and 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 then then that book has lived in my head for 30 years um yeah so so i think that's just a good a good writing technique to make sure that the that the reader walks away from your book sort of brooding over over its contents um yeah, and I, I think King does this a lot. You know, I, I think like he he concludes the plot, he concludes the story, but I think often he's kind of ambiguous on what the thematic conclusion should be. It's like here I presented some arguments to you about what I'm trying to say about this, um, and, and and like I think that this book is a perfect example of like should you be hopeful? Like like is is that the right way to feel? Um, sh- should I? Should, should I demand more out of my life or like, like <laughs> I, I just, I keep thinking about like do the day and let the day do you. Right. Which is, which is kind of this, this idea distilled, right. Is like sometimes life's just going to do what it wants to you, but you need to demand a lot out of life too. And you need to work. So I, yeah, I, I don't know. And I think, you know, I'm thinking of it just because when we last spoke with you, Kim, we were, we were reading it. And that's like another book that ends like the, the plot has a definitive ending, but like the questions of, what is what does it mean like what does friendship mean what is like the idea of of what does it mean that they lose their memory at the end of it like what does that mean and how 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 does our interpretation about that what mean what that means affects what we see the character's journeys as and like yeah all my favorite books do stuff like this where it's just like it it, it doesn't have to end on a mid plot beat but it ends kind of like it's not going to tell you what your interpretation of the theme should be yeah love it all I know is anytime I listen to soundscapes and hear the ocean, I feel differently now. <laughs> it's got a little bit more of an ominous uh-huh. tone than peaceful, relaxing. I'm like, she's out there. Yeah. She's out there. That's great. On Did the, you on the dead some, ship. Some shells rubbing up against each other. Oh my God. That's so creepy. It's so perfect. It's just <laughs> shells. Of the, oh God. So good. So yeah. good. They were his voice the whole time. Oh, Ugh. So- I love it. Oh, I love it. Love it. Haunted. Haunted. <laughs> love it. We're gonna have to make shirts. Yeah. Haunted by yeah. Dumaki. <laughs> haunted by Dumaki. There's Proudly a mug. haunted. There's a mug. Proudly. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, Kim, this was so wonderful. Thank you so much. This was everything I, I hoped it would be. Um, it like I, I think we all really love this book, and it was great getting to, get to talk to you about it instead of just having to talk to Matt again for an hour. You know, I get sick of him every <laughs> yeah, once in a while. So. It's a real relief. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for coming on. Thank it, it was great. Really wonderful. Oh, the honor is mine. I love you guys so much and I so support your show. I'm just a drooling fan over here and I'm always incredibly inspired by all that you do. And I know this is a labor of love. I get it. So I I appreciate you both so much for all the insight, for all the care. It just, it makes my life better. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. It was so great being with you guys talking about a novel that is in my top five kings. Oh, love it. Love it. Thanks. So so tell us a little bit about uh, The Year of Underrated Stephen King. I know you just uh, released your, your John Langan episode, um, which is great. I haven't finished it yet, but uh, everything I've, I've listened to so far is great. We just read The Fisherman, I think, Matt, how long ago was that? Just a few months ago. Uh, yeah, within the last three or just seven months. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, John Langan is a Christmas miracle. Let me tell you, <laughs> C- come very early. He was so incredibly kind because lately, I don't know, 2024, I'm like, sure, I can be the Dolly Parton of Stephen King podcast and just <laughs> ask people nicely, <laughs> see what happens. And it worked. And he was so nice to me. And he was just an absolute overflowing wealth of knowledge and wanted to talk about King. And so he was just amazing. I can't believe it happened. I can't believe it's real. It, it, that's kind of where we're at. But my podcast is I'm basically a university fiction teacher by day. So I kind of echo that at night with my <laughs> King book reviews. So I kind of do a classroom approach and try and keep it infotaining. And I would love to go super duper in depth, but I condense it a little bit and just break down the books and talk about the good, the bad, the ugly and questions. (laughs) So um, it's been four years. I'm still having fun, but my favorite part is talking with folks like yourself and the King community. That's my favorite part is all the friends I've made along the way have made it the best. Great. Yeah. Yeah. You, you just did, uh, Mr. Mercedes, um, not too long ago, uh, which is a book we'll be covering here in a, a few months. Uh, we got quite a big book to get to first, but then we'll be on the Mr. Mercedes. What, uh, what book do you have on the docket next? <gasps> on the docket next? Well, since I'm freshly done with Duma for the third time, I got some thoughts. I got a vent about Pam a little, so I might do a, a Duma. <laughs> I might do a Duma return, like just a little quick recap because nice, nice. I adore Duma so much. I got to talk about it a little bit more because when I first did a Duma episode, I was like baby podcaster and it sounds like I recorded in a military trench. So <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, might have a few thoughts on Duma and then Finders Keepers because that's where my Stephen King book club, that's where we're at. And I really enjoyed my time with Finders Keepers. It's such a weird, strange little good book. That's such an outlier in the series. So there's that. And then hopefully after I return to Roland and we'll start Wolves of the Kala oh for the very goodness. first time. I'm so I excited. Anxiously awaiting that. Yeah. Awesome. I'm so excited. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I had a nice buffer with the unconventional path that is went through the keyhole. I detoured. Um, so I got my palate cleanser there and now I'm ready. I'm ready to, to start wolves. There's something poetic about that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Good to know. Okay. I'm going to keep that in mind. I'm excited. I'm going to keep that in mind. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait for you to experience those last three books. Um, I'm definitely going to have to talk to you about it once you get yeah. to the end. I'm so excited to talk to talk about it with tower junkies and tower experts. I need your help. I have so many questions, so I'm really thrilled to be making my way into the into the rest of them to to talk more. But yeah, I will totally see you guys in June. So I'm so excited for that. So hopefully, I'll have wolves done so I can pick your guys's brain. Awesome. Can't wait. It's going to be great. Well, th- thanks again for coming. Um, wonderful. And and we will look forward to those episodes. I, I am leaving Duma Key behind, but I am anxiously awaiting your episode just to, to hear people talk about it more. Yay. Thank you guys so much. This is the coolest place. See, we told you. 
we told you it was great. You didn't believe us, but <laughs> but we were right. And now you know. Yeah, it's it's uh <laughs> I, I really did think that was an amazing conversation. Um no, I, 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 I I love I love it when when we find new things that we hadn't found even after all of the hours of talking over the material, you know? It's- yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I love, I love that you and I can do that. And I also love when we occasionally get to have some new, uh, some new voices on, um, that can show things to us from a different perspective. It's always, it's always really great. Yep. Uh, if you haven't listened to Kim's podcast yet, like go do it right now. It's, it's excellent. Like, like we said on the show, uh, she has an episode on Mr. Mercedes. It's out now. You can kind of use that as a prep for our eventual, uh, episodes on that book. Uh, so go check out Kim's podcast, subscribe, listen to it. She's phenomenal. We love it. And we're always so happy to have her on. Yeah. And she also has an episode on Duma key. Um, so True. Yeah. if you're, if you're not topped up on Duma key after this, then go check that out. <laughs> That's a good reminder for me because I actually hadn't listened to her Duma Key episode yet because I knew we were going to be covering it. And I was like, ah, I want to wait until we're finished with it and then I can listen to some other stuff. So right. I'm going to go back and do that um, um, right now. See you later. Bye. All right. Later. Um, no, no, just, no. We have no. <laughs> we have some mailbag uh, questions to answer here. So let's just uh, let's just knock them out, Matt. Let's go down the list and answer some questions. All right. So first, um, from Pear Jane, we have... Uh, usually I ask about what surprised you, but this time I want to ask about the clear end parallel between this and the Shawshank Redemption. Wireman even tells Edgar he could use a man with a construction background, like he's a man who can just acquire things from time to time. What do you think? Purposeful? Coincidental? Just an indicator that King really wants to run a Mexican hotel with his best buddy? Um, Man, so it, it, it's funny because I, I feel like this thought flickered through my mind for a fraction of a second where, where it was like, oh, it's going to be just like in the ending of Shawshank Redemption where they go to Mexico together. Um, and and that, like if it's purposeful, then the purpose is to make us have that thought and then make us feel really sad that that's not, you know, it, it would be as if, um, you know, Red goes to Mexico following um, – Dufresne and Dufresne is already dead, right? <laughs> you just be like, <laughs> oh God, uh, why don't I watch yeah. this movie? You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember if if the book ends different from the movie ends because the the clearest image of Shawshank I have in my head is is the movie in which they see each other on the beach. I can't remember if the book well, ends differently. I, I didn't read it, but my recollection from like the last time we talked about this was that it ends with Red like sort of hopefully planning but like like heading there but he he doesn't know like it's like who knows what the future holds but but uh but dufresne has given me hope and hope is what's important right yeah Um, yeah no i i agree i agree yeah i mean i think i think that king does obviously just like have a thing with this idea of starting a new life in mexico with uh one of your best friends and and building something cool yeah yeah i mean all men really just want to run away and hang out with their male best bud in mexico yeah. i think that's True. universal actually matt you want to you want to go to mexico i that's what i was hinting at man <laughs> <laughs> Start a, just buy a hotel buy a hotel doesn't that sound great yeah a hotel I, ideally a hotel where no one would ever go so we don't have to do any work i feel like this is like the the middle-aged man version of w- we should open a bar that's yeah. like the we should open a bar is like a 20 something male <laughs> yeah fantasy uh, this is the middle-aged one we should move to mexico and open a hotel yeah well it, the thing about owning a hotel is it it's like the fantasy of having everything be just the way you like it where yeah. like you, you're taking care of people but not in a way where they really have any say you know <laughs> yeah i like it i like it yeah all right next we have nosh who says i loved this book it was my first time reading doom and i really enjoyed it along with you guys i loved how the book resonated so clearly with how king continually describes his writing process folks often label king as a pantser or a gardener but neither really fit king is a performative writer once the draft is complete it's done and then he keeps the edit process deliberately light-handed which comes out in the original draft what comes out in the original draft stays giving his work a dreamlike quality i compare king to an impasto painter and an improv performer laying the work as it comes to him the essence contains an ephemeral energy where the flaws and strangeness contribute to the visceral impact of the work 
King has stated that his fear of not finishing pushes him to work until the piece is done. Then his interest wanes, preventing him from reworking too much. Improvements instead come in the iterations, like Edgar's painting. King revisits concepts again and again. Small town pettiness plays out in magical gadgets, is refined further in needful things. Writers haunted by their evil alter ego secret window secret garden then to the dark half i see king has a writer more akin to robin williams mel torm or Jimi hendrix he relies on techniques he spent a lifetime mastering to create and compose in the moment then move on i'm curious what do you both think of this idea matt what do you think what's your what's your initial response to that idea that's it, it's i really like this answer um so, so i didn't read it in in advance so so as you were reading it out loud just now scott and like as you were you know, in the first paragraph of the answer, I was like, this kind of reminds me of, um, 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 gosh, that fa- extremely famous actor who you and I both really like, who's in The Weatherman, uh, whose name Nicholas I'm blanking Cage? on. Nicholas Cage, yes. Um, Nicholas Cage, who's like this shaman actor where he like <laughs> do, you know, it, incredibly interesting things. And he always has like a really interesting and, and sort of, I, I like the word performative. That That's just what jumped out to me about it is it's, it's, it's like this sort of, larger than life sort of intentionally um i've heard it called like almost um um like a throwback to a vaudevillian acting style and mm. but and like you and i happen to really love nicholas cage but it doesn't work on a lot of people um and i i think it's funny because I, I think the same could be said of king like like king's shtick doesn't work on everyone but but i think i think the, the style of it really works for us and i i think you're i think you're totally right like this is this is how he's able to write so much is he 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 has trained himself to just do a really good job the first time through if he had to go back and do extensive edits to make his books work that he would just never do that that just wouldn't happen we'd have a george mm-hmm. r. r martin situation yeah i really like the idea of um the the, the ed he doesn't refine his stories via edit he refines his stories via iteration the idea that why do we talk about small towns so much why do we talk about you know why are there's there's so many similar things things and ideas across king books and it's because he's refining how he feels about these things rather than doing it in in a long editing process for one book i like that idea a lot i think that's really cool yeah right because i mean i I think there's something to be said for any uh, each of his iterations is sort of saying something different and finding some Mm -hmm. different part of the idea to talk about um Mm -hmm. i I like Mm -hmm. that a lot this this is a really really cool comment Uh, i'll I'll be thinking about this i think yeah definitely uh dj nedelko says you mentioned briefly just how visual this book is and how surprising it is that no one has tried to adapt it to a movie if a director could adapt a stephen king novel into a movie and do the movie justice i.e keep characters true to the way they are written keep the themes and plots sensible which character would you most like to play and why you can pick from any of the kingslingers books we've read you can pick a character from any movie already out honestly just answer however you want well i appreciate that freedom there what do you what do you think scott i i i, I don't know that um the, the the first things that jump to mind might be the most obvious for me where, where i just yeah. like think of like jack torrance where it's like that would be fun to play but that's not necessarily the most interesting you know um, yeah this is an interesting question because we've been asked before like who would you want to be mm-hmm. in a king story which i think is a different question to if you were an actor which which role would be uh, the most fulfilling to play. Um, yeah. oh, that's a good question. I'm, I'm blanking right now and I'm, tr- I was trying to bide time as I thought of my answer, but um, I think Jack Torrance is a, is a good answer. Uh, I'm trying to mentally go through characters in my head. Um, I, I, I mean, I think it'd be fun to play villains. Like I think playing flag would be fun. Um, just cause yeah. you'd get to like flex some acting muscles that I'm assuming I have. Uh, right. if, if as part of the the scenario that this question is is building is that I am a very talented good actor um that yeah 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 that makes that makes a lot of sense it'd be fun it's funny I, I was like I could play just like I could play Rose the Hat just <laughs> make Rose the Hat be a male character and <laughs> now I'm Rose why would you hat. do that why would you take uh the incredible Rebecca Ferguson away from us Matt I mean that's, that's selfish that's the, the funny thing is probably the reason why I want to be that character is that Rebecca Ferguson did such an amazing job and had so much fun with it clearly that it's like, mm-hmm. well, that's, I, I want, I want to do that. Um, I also think being Ben, b- playing Ben Mears might be like potentially interesting because mm-hmm. th- so, so the reason I say that is like, I feel like one could, could put their own spin on Ben Mears. 
mm-hmm. and have that be an interesting um interesting uh, uh adaptation yeah I yeah know. i like that i like that uh your your idea there prompted a response from me okay. and i'm not i i guess i'm technically picking a salem's lot character but i think playing father callahan in the dark tower stretch would be a lot of fun. I think he's a very, very complicated, interesting character. I don't know. Maybe it's just because I'm feeling old these days, but like my instinct was to lean more heavily towards the older characters for whatever reason. I don't know why. Like Callahan's definitely older than both of us are, but I don't know. That just felt, it felt right to me. Sure. Like it's like Eddie. No, that's way too, that's way too young. I'm too old for for Eddie Dean. Uh, But yeah, you play Callahan. Seems right. I'll play Jake. (laughs) Yeah. You you balance it out. Actually, yeah, yeah. So, so then you saying that made me think I, I would love to just do um, Blaine's voice. That that would just be a delight, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, that'd be a lot of fun. I I am like in the in the Flanagan adaptation that we're pretending is definitely happening and right. will one hundred percent happen. I am wondering who they get to to play Blaine. I think that would be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's gonna be awesome. 100%. Great question. That was fun. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve Living Room says, Matt, have you listened to the Wheel Weaves podcast on the Wheel of Time? It's a great show, but I had a question about their format. They only do 25 to 30 pages a week, so they take about six months for each book. It's because they both work and have kids. My question for you both is how would it change your show and your process if you went that slow? Oh, boy. Um, That's a good question. First of all, I guess, Matt, answer the have you listened to this podcast before? No, I have not. Um, I don't really listen to any Wheel of Time podcasts. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. It's, it's interesting. Like that, that is it. So, so it's funny. I can't really say much because I haven't heard the show, so I don't really know how mm-hmm. they do it. But like, it, it's like the the episodes would either have to be shorter, or a lot of what we talked about would be sort of free range conversation, not necessarily rooted in the text. I mean, you and I are already pretty bad about free range conversation, not rooted (laughs) in the text, but Uh I feel like at a certain point, there's only so much you can say about that much text. Also, there's a lot of the wheel of time that is to put it bluntly, not very dense. Um, (laughs) But, you know, maybe, maybe I'm off base and maybe this podcast finds all sorts of stuff to talk about that, that I'm just, uh, not observant enough to catch it's it's true that i didn't actually read the wheel of time um in like 20 years so i might have just been too you know naive to understand what it was doing that's entirely possible yeah again i i haven't read the books or or listened to this podcast but my so my my gut instinct knowing me and you and what we do is that would probably be too few pages um i mean we Mm -hmm. do have some like i think our second episode covering uh 112263 is like 55 pages long just because of the way section breaks happened um so we do have some that that are shorter than others um but i feel like that would be too few pages like my biggest my biggest worry when we do these books like this is that we do lose the the forest for the trees sometimes like we get so and i think you talked about this with with kim that we get so into you know the 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 moment the things that are happening in the moment that we forget about the larger picture and and kind of drive ourselves crazy sometimes and my yeah. worry would be if we did 20 i mean 25 pages that's like half an hour of reading yeah i mean we, we would hopefully make just shorter episodes <laughs> but um i feel like we would lose the overall picture of the book a little bit um right doing, being that close to the text and that that little of a slice yeah right i mean it's it's to reiterate what I probably just said a few minutes ago, like the if if you if you're missing something because you're seeing the second beat of a three beat and the first beat was like three weeks ago, mm-hmm. um, but if you had been reading the book normally, then you would have definitely remembered it. Um, then that can be an unnecessary problem, right? But there's I don't know. There, yeah. There's plenty of stuff to talk about regardless. I'm, it's not a yeah. I mean, there's a, like the thing I've learned is especially with King, there's always there's always stuff to talk about. So like mm-hmm. if we said if we said right now we're changing the format for eleven twenty two sixty three, we're only going to do thirty pages an episode. Uh, we're going to be on this book for the rest of the year. <laughs> um, I th- I think the shows. Well, I, I guess the hope would be that we would make a shorter show. Like that's that's. I I know I say this every time and and every time our listeners are like no no we like the long shows but like. I wish we made a 90 minute show mm-hmm. or less. 
I really do. And it just never happens that way because there's just too much to talk about. So like my hope would be that if we did something like that, it would be a shorter show. My feeling is we would somehow find a way to fill the time <laughs> no yeah. matter what um, and just kind of revert back to our roughly two hours plus plus audience interaction section no matter how many pages we're covering. Um, yeah, yeah. Much of our format is not so much a decision as just the way that we end up doing it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it just kind of happens. And like, you can we can look at our scripts and be like, oh, we made a short one this week. It's going to be great. And then the episode's longer than any of them because yeah. we just go on those digressions. And, right. and those digressions are some of my favorite parts of the show, to be honest with you. So I, I never want to take those out, but that's just the the way it is. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly for us, it just doesn't make sense to do that short of uh, sections and again neither of us have listened to the show so we're not commenting on the quality of of that idea uh i just like it's specific to us and what we do i just don't think that would work for us yeah yeah uh, uh steve also says matt is approaching having read roughly one third of stephen king's books crazy how much is still out there for him to explore <laughs> does that does that surprise you matt that after five <laughs> years almost you're just about a third of the way through just- just a little baby King newbie having read one third of his, his corpus. Um, no, I, I did not know that. Like you're, you're, you're telling me this now for the first time. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. It's, I, 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 I mean, I feel like I have a good handle on Stephen King as a, as a creator now. Um, mm-hmm. and, it, and, it, and at the same time, it makes me smile to think that there are so many more of his books that I haven't read because yeah. you know i'm somebody who really really gets into an author and i read everything of their of their stuff like historically this has been my thing um and and it's cool to know that it will be genuinely difficult <laughs> to read everything <laughs> of stephen king's um that just gives it, it gives you something to look forward to yeah yeah no that's that's awesome um i i, I got it i've never i knew it right like it it feels like you've barely scratched the surface. Well, at the same time, it feels like as, as, at least by the end of this season, you will have gotten the core experience. Like, uh, but even that's not true because like, there's so many classic King books that you've seen some of the adaptations. Like you haven't read Christine. Um, you haven't actually read pet cemetery. Right. Uh, like these are, these are classic King books that you haven't actually experienced. Um, you haven't read Tommy Knockers. You have to read Tom. We got a. We got a I didn't answer uh, on Twitter yet, but we got a message from someone saying, "Are you guys going to ever cover Tommy Knockers? Because it's it's one of my favorites, and nobody ever talks about it." And I was like, "No." Nope. Um, but I, I still think it would be fun for you to read that book, like e- even if parts of it would be a slog for you because sure. you get to see a different. Like, I I honestly the way we've set this up i don't think you've read a bad book yet like you've read books that we liked to various degrees like we were mixed on parts of desperation i think we were mixed on parts of salem's lot but like i'm kind of picking and choosing like the best of the best of the best um so i think it's true you're getting a a holistic king experience you are not getting any of the stinkers and i I, like stinker is a, a rough word but um you're not getting the ones yeah. that I would say. No, no, this one's just not good. Yeah. So, I mean, it's interesting. I, I'm probably saying one of those, you know, monkey's paw statements where I'll, I'll look back on this and laugh. But, like, it's hard for me to think of a Stephen King book that would be a slog. And what I mean by that is even if it's, like, ill-conceived and has a meandering plot, like, he's just such a a fun uh like perspective writer like mm-hmm. doesn't really matter what's happening you're you're like with the character even if what's happening makes no sense like we've read we've read some of his short stories that were that that I I, I think you and I agree are just not very good but even those I wouldn't have called them a slog because at least there's an energy to them and you, you know you get through them and you're and you're basically like that wasn't very good but you're not like <laughs> mad you know um yeah so yeah, that's fair. And even like, you know, I think um, Tommy Knockers has kind of been our become our, our whipping boy a little bit here. Um, but I, I like I don't think that's a very good book, but I enjoyed my time with it still. I think honestly, the only King book that I've ever actually been like, oh, my gosh, this is tough to get through 
is uh, Sleeping Beauties. Um, and that's the one he wrote with his son, Owen. And like, I think we've said this before. I'll say it again. I get to I get to blame Owen for that. I don't know if that's the truth or not, but I get to say, oh, those is probably all the Owen parts that I thought were slogs. Um, uh-huh. and, and even like by the end of that book, I, I, I like enjoyed it. I didn't love it, but I enjoyed it. So I, I don't know. Like it, it's, it, it is fascinating. You, you're absolutely right that even, even if you can like sitting there, you're getting the feeling that, that this is just not as high quality. It's not as complicated. It's not as deep. It's not as well crafted, uh, as, as some of his best. Um, there's still a lot to love. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Cool. Great questions. Right. Yeah, thanks. So Ishmael75 says, let's say Roland opens another door to any non-Dark Tower book and can pull through another character to aid him on his quest and become a gunslinger. Who would you pick and why? They say, I'd pick Mary Jackson. I think she showed some real metal when dealing with that godforsaken town in tack. <laughs> she was tough, but didn't lose her compassion. Um. Yeah, gosh, that, that, it's it's interesting because I feel like basically every other book at some point we point out a character and we're like, now that's a gunslinger. <laughs> um. So you know, Mary Jackson, that's a great pick. That is a great we, pick. We covered, we covered so many books at this point that it's genuinely not trivial for me to like mentally flip through, um, the list. Let's let let's let's do it anyway. <laughs> Um, so I guess are we are we talking specific king books here? It seems like it, right? Like yeah. not any book anywhere ever, but just other I, king stories that don't overlap with the Dark Tower. I interpreted it as being any king book, but it doesn't actually say that. It mm-hmm. says another door to any non Dark Tower book. So well, let's just say king books because yeah, if yeah. there's we have to limit ourselves a little bit here. We're never yeah. going to come up with an answer. Yeah, yeah. That's um, you know, I mean, the uh, 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 Jack. Um, the, I feel like the most obvious answer, which I'm just going to go with, despite it being obvious, is is Jack. Um, traveling Jack Sawyer. Jack Sawyer. Yeah. 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 Um, just so, just so you folks out there know how bad my memory is, I'm literally opening our show schedule right now to remind myself of what books we've read. Before I answer this question. Way ahead of you, buddy. <laughs> um, I, J- Jack Sawyer is a, a good answer. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of leaning towards someone from it. Uh, I think the yeah. losers are pretty damn effective and would be good. You know, no, you know what? Uh, it's it's Ralph from Insomnia. That's my answer. He yeah, has I'd... he has finger guns. He'd be awesome. Yeah, Ralph crossed my mind, and then I just went with the obvious, but I, I, I like that answer. Cause, cause it's a non, like the cool thing about the, the Cotet of 19 is like, they're not all just like grizzled badasses They They have, they all have flaws. They all have weaknesses. And I think Ralph would fit right in, in his own way. Um, he, of, of, of being a misfit. Um, I, I do think one thing that would be really interesting is introducing Ralph to this idea. And I'm going to get, we've been having fun. I'm going to get real serious here for a minute because this is just occurring to me real time. But one of the things that the Cotet is missing is this idea of, you know, a long, a long lifelong love that was lost. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Roland has his, his, the great love of his life, Susan, that was so cruelly taken away from him at the very beginning. Um, And then, you know, we have, we have Eddie and, and Susanna and their love, but we don't have this like we don't have this this kind of melancholy mourning of of a a, a, a a lifelong love that was taken away. And so Ralph being entered into that group with that perspective and that ability to teach Roland kind of what love looks like 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road, I think would be an interesting new dynamic in that group. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm liking it more and more the more I think about it, actually. Yeah, for sure. I mean, Ralph ends up being like incredibly heroic, actually. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's, almost, it's almost like he, his self-image clashes so much with the sort of stakes of the finale that, that, that you, you forget what a badass Ralph is. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'm just, it's funny. As we're talking, I'm just remembering how awesome that book was. That's a, that's a great book. 
um, mm-hmm. insomnia. Yeah, it cool. really was. It's very, very, very silly. Um, not one I would ever put in like my top list, but I really enjoyed our time with it. That was a, a, a fun book to cover for sure. I agree. All right. Uh, Budagami says there are a number of songs that I associate with certain King works slash scenes and vice versa. They fit together somehow. Some like Velcro fly in the wastelands make sense. Others like I need some sleep and the dead zone and rolling in the deep. And this book are less clear. Have you experienced this phenomenon? And if so, which book and song Matt, you got anything for this? Um, not, not really. Um, well, certainly not off the top of my head. I mean, there are probably certain songs I was listening to when I was reading certain books, and if I really thought about it, it might jump to mind. But I don't, um, I don't, I, I don't, I, I think I probably listen to a, a slightly below average amount of music, um, personally. So, because I listen to so many podcasts and audiobooks, honestly, is, yeah. is, is the reason. <laughs> um, Podcasting has really killed my the 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 amount of time I spend on on music unfortunately and I, I like music but I don't have like we, we have to talk about this on the doofcast all the time because we get these movies with these incredible scores just absolutely incredible staggering scores and we'll do an entire episode for an hour and a half on the movie and not mention the music once and then we'll have a listener that's like hey you didn't all talk about the great score of dune 2 why didn't you do that and it's just because my brain doesn't think about music that way unfortunately like i like music but i just don't think about music at all really yeah well and and i'm certainly not parsing it consciously while watching a movie like i went that's a good example because i went and i listened to the dean soundtrack 47 times and now i have Mm -hmm. all kinds of stuff to say about the dean soundtrack but i certainly didn't have that to say from watching the movie one time um yeah so yeah anyway i i to, to get back to the question, the answer is basically just no. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I just don't hear music in my head that way when I'm like reading or something for whatever reason. Like, like I agree with you. If if the if the book takes time to like say, well, even that's not true. Like when it when it brings up Velcro Fly for the Wastelands, I'm not like hearing Velcro Fly in my head <laughs> as I'm reading those parts. It's just not how my brain works. Yeah. Right. Right. The one thing I will say is I watched uh, episode seven of Castle Rock today in uh-huh. preparation for our show on that. And they did that fucking song that's in um, Arrival uh-huh. and uh, Sunrise, is it? Uh, sun Sunshine, I think. Sunshine. Yeah. That fucking devastate, like that Art. song that's a cheat code for making you cry. Yeah. I forget it's, what it's called. It's called but... On the Nature of Daylight by Max Richter. Yeah, it's evil. Yeah because it's it, it works so well yeah, it doesn't it, uh, the funny thing about that is it, it's the song started and i was like i'm gonna cry like 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 <laughs> even being aware of like the magic spell being cast upon me i had no power to stop yep. it yep um, yep all right uh toss 7594 says hey guys do you have t- uh so f- so you have mentioned rev- reviving the show once flanagan's dark tower series comes out do you have any intent on doing on doing so with other adaptations of books you've covered like the new Salem's lot or Netflix's talisman or for the possible third talisman book, the, the, the King recently hinted um, on that subject. Would you like to see a third talisman book? How should Jack Sawyer's story end? Oh, really good questions. Um, we will definitely 100% be covering Flanagan's dark tower series uh, when it comes out. Like absolutely. Like whether, whether it's, here or or something else like that's gonna happen for sure um i haven't thought about the other things like that i I really hadn't thought about there is a a salem's lot movie coming out um not coming to theaters by the way (laughs) direct direct to max for this one so not not hopeful on the quality of that one um and i i have no idea how netflix's talisman series is doing last i understood that was kind of stalled out because it's being done by uh the guys doing stranger things and i think they basically said we're finishing stranger things which also got delayed uh so i i that project might not happen but i mean it's a good general question of like hey you cover these books in a, in a, in a great amount of detail are you going to come back to the show if any adaptation of those books come out um yeah maybe like like if let's say i think they asked about the third talisman book specifically but let's say like tomorrow king says i got a new book coming out in 2025 and it's a tower story like yeah we're gonna (laughs) we're gonna be on that shit right like yeah uh but like definitive plan i i don't i don't know i don't know what do you think 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think a fair answer is probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. But but it, it, anything could happen. I mean, we we schedule things out pretty far in advance, so mm-hmm. it's like <laughs> it, it's just impossible to say because we could already have some other thing planned and, and you know yeah. in the works at that time. Which you know we're not we're not we're not going to abandon something that we're committed to, right? So yeah, um, very hard to say is the truth. Yeah, that's a good point. Just just so y'all know, we already know what we're doing when the show comes to an end. Um, with a with I would say about an eighty percent certainty. Um, yeah. So, but I, like I've always thought of like this this feed, even if we're not making shows regularly for it. Like there's an opportunity to come back and do one off episodes. Like let's say you you on your own go out and read, um, Tommy Knockers or 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 Cujo or one right. of these books, and you're like Scott, I really need to talk to you about these books. Like, uh. Yeah maybe we, maybe it's not like six episodes eight episodes it's it's one episode where we're just chatting about the book for a little while and then this is the perfect feed to release it on so right. i've always kind of an, envisioned that in my head um so so yeah i think i think probably is a good answer <laughs> yeah i agree yeah uh as far as the talisman I don't, how do you feel about this matt i feel like i feel like the talisman is a stephen king peter straub series and i feel like even if king has a really good idea I feel like this the series should die with with Mr. Straub. I, I just I feel like it's the, like the series of the two of them and mm-hmm. he's gone now. Rest in peace. And I just I just don't think King should carry on with it. I think it was their thing together. And and honestly, like I know they had an idea for a third book. I'm OK with the way the, the Black House ended. I'm OK yeah. with that as the end of Jack Sawyer's story. Um, I don't, right. but I don't know. How, how do you feel? I mean, I basically agree with that. It, I, I felt like that was a, a solid ending for that character. And I don't, it's not obvious to me what else you would do with that character. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, I, again, you know, perhaps they have an incredible idea. And if I heard the idea, I would be like, oh yes, I definitely want to read that, you know, but, um, that felt like an end. And I feel like if King has some idea that he wants to write, <laughs> not that he has to listen to me but it would like i would say just write it just write it as a separate thing just write it Mm -hmm. as a story starring sack joyer um (laughs) and the 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 you know former cop who i like like what like does it need to be the third talisman book for this idea to work maybe it does you know for all Mm -hmm. for all we know um i don't know i yeah i I say all of this and, and yet like if he made a third talisman book i would read it so it's like i'm kind of i don't know am i a hypocrite yeah I, it, it's uh it just it's just i'm like i feel like that story is done in, in my mind that feels done to me so yeah i mean i i agree and but but i also said why are we making a sequel to the shining <laughs> that's a terrible idea uh and and while i'm mixed on the book um the flanagan adaptation kind of just made me say oh yeah this is why we did this story this is why mm-hmm. this is important um yeah so yeah i i i'll never say never like i'm trying to think of like what would be a good continuation for the jack sawyer story that would as you said not be something he could just put into a different idea that would require jack sawyer and i'm trying to come up with something in my head of like you know the first book is about him traveling between worlds the second book ends with him definitively stuck in midworld or or what was it called in I can't remember what the, it was called. The territories. The territories. Thank you. Um, and, and so like this would have to be a territories focused book. Um, I just, I still like, I still struggle on like, okay, but what is his arc through this book? He's stuck in the territories to heal. What is his arc? And I just, I, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a writer, so I can't come up with that. I'll, I'll leave that to Mr. King, but right. I just don't, it doesn't feel necessary to me. Yeah. We'll see. Mm-hmm. Kevin Sting says uh, there's one narrative choice in it that has always baffled me. Uh, Kevin says they just finished it and then our series on it. And so they had a question specifically to that. The viewpoint of the very first paragraph in the book is bizarre. He describes how the terror starts as best as he could tell with Georgie's boat, but that's completely incorrect. It has been around for thousands of years. So the terror has been there for however long it was around. So who is he being represented in as best as he can tell? It can't be Mike Hanlon because he knows how long it has been there because of the smokehouse visions. If it's supposed to be an all knowing omnipotent, 
omniscient presence, then he would be wrong because the terror didn't start until 1958. Then at the end of the chapter, they describe the journey that Georgie's boat goes through all underneath Derry, but then not knowing where the boat goes after that. How does this narrator know everything that happens to the boat in Derry, but not after? Who is this misinformed narrator? It's just a bizarre choice. Can you solve this mystery or was King simply too powerful to be edited by, by this point in his career? <laughs> I think we like vaguely talked about this in that episode um yeah just that it, it's it's very unusual the way the narrator kind of makes their states themselves and then that's not really a thing that happens in the rest of the book yeah so this is not a not a genuine answer maybe because i don't think i can defend this at all but i, I i've always kind of liked the idea that bill is the narrator slash writer of the story i mean he is mm-hmm. he's the novelist he is the guy who has who, who in fact writes horror stories to, you know, metabolize the repressed memories of his childhood. So it makes total sense that he would be telling the story. And furthermore, it makes even more sense for the actual beginning of his involvement in the story to be Georgie's boat. I mean, that's, that's the beginning of Bill's involvement. That's the beginning of Bill's story. Um, and Bill is, if, if there's anybody who is, you know, the central protagonist of it, it is Bill. Um, yeah. So but it, 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 unless this is just a sort of mit- mistake, then the answer kind of has to be Bill, I think. I I, I like that. I, I do agree with you that the the um it, it starts it starts the terror starts with Georgie's boat is a reflection of who our protagonist is. And and mm-hmm. this is this is this this is the start of the story. It's not the start of it, it's not the start of everything bad that's happened in Derry, obviously, but the start of the story is Georgie's murder. And it, it, I guess it makes it re- a little redundant for the narrator to say the story begins at the beginning of the story. Mm-hmm. Um, but essentially that's what he's saying it, it is. And, and I, I like that. I like that it's Bill. I, I also just like, I th- like once again, we've talked about this a lot, but this is King's like most consistent through line is that he, he writes like a person sitting at a bar, sharing a tale uh-huh. with, with a friend or, or someone he just met. And like, like it, be, the, the terror began as as best as I can tell with Georgie's boat. Like it's just like the way you'd start a story when you're just sharing with a bunch of people around a table or something. Like it's yeah. just it's just like, and I feel like he loves that idea. He loves that aesthetic. He loves the, the sound of that, and he's and so he includes it here because yeah, it, it is pretty inconsistent. The narrator of it is not a presence in it very much at all. This is the one big moment where where he personifies himself and it's, I think it's like the only moment really. Yeah. Well, yeah, correct. Aside from the fact that we also have these Mike Hanlon interludes, yeah, which sure, are explicitly. Sure. So, so like that's the, the only other possible answer is Mike Hanlon, but that doesn't, mm-hmm. I mean, it could be, it could be Mike Hanlon. You know, I, I'm not, I don't want to shoot that down. If somebody, I think somebody could define, sorry, could, could defend Mike Hanlon as an answer just as well as, as I could defend, Bill Denborough. So, um, yeah, because, uh, you know, and it also includes this element of like historiography, which is pervasive in, in Mike's interludes where he's trying to piece together what happened by talking to people and, and figure things out. But he, he knows that he never quite really knows the answers to these questions. Yeah. So it, it would, it would feel right for him to say like, well, as best as I can tell, you know, I don't actually know who Pennywise's first victim was in the in the fifties, but as best I can tell, it was, it was, um, Georgie, um, that, that, that could fit too, actually. Yeah. I mean, and just him saying, you know, my place in the story began, um, when I joined up with these kids, that portion of the story of Pennywise began when, uh, when Bill's brother was killed. So yeah. I think yeah. that, I think it works for Mike too. Yeah. 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 All right. Cool. Um, all right. Uh, Andrew C says, have you ever noticed how often King writes about occupational injuries or deaths uh, into his work. Edgar gets mashed by a crane in Dumaki. An old and poorly maintained boiler blows in The Shining. The Mangler from Night Shift is pretty explicitly related to occupational safety. There are other examples. Um, thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I have an immediate thought, which is so I'm um, like I think I just mentioned with Kim. I, I have been reading um, on writing. And he he talks quite a bit about the absolute shit jobs that he had and that his mother had, um, 
well, the, the, that his mother had when he was a child and then that he had when he was a young man. And I'm, I'm sure that just the, the, the very practical risks that, that, that his mother encountered and that he faced were just something that was on his mind. And it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's something that sticks with you, right? It's a, it's a real genuine source of fear. And I yeah. think he, he just kind of reflexively grabs for those things and incorporates them into his stories. I agree. Like he, he, you know, he grew up working class. He was, he was pretty poor. He talks about a lot in that book. They were, they were very, very poor uh, uh, right up until they sold Carrie. Um, and so this is the most, the m- things that most informed his life were working class jobs that are, uh, can be unsafe that, that especially if people's laziness or incompetence in, in doing the safety, like the management's indifference, like even, even um uh graveyard shift is a little bit of that, you know, like management doesn't give a shit about you. Go, yeah. go clean out the rats. I don't care. Right. Um, right. Yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. Cause that, yep. yeah, that was, that was his life right now, up until he finally could make a living writing. Exactly. Uh, insane. Bl- By the way, Andrew's question was not specifically for the mailbag. They just emailed that to us a couple weeks ago, and I never, <laughs> I never responded. And I was like, "Oh, this is a perfect time to respond." So I, I just threw that in. Oh, cool. Uh, insane blind heart says, "What is your process for writing the script for the show? Do you talk through together, or Scott writes an outline and Matt adds to it? What's the decision on what to include and what to surprise the other host with?" This is a fun question. I don't want to spend too much time on it, though, because it gets really into the weeds. Um, essentially, our process right now is I read the section of the book twice on a good week. I don't always actually have time with this, but one time is just me kind of reading casually through. Um, and the second time I have my highlighter out and I'm highlighting sections and things and taking notes on things that are jumping out to me. Um, I put my book in front of me with my highlights and my notes and I open a Google doc and I just kind of go and leave, um, things there. I, I, if I highlighted a passage, I'll probably grab that and and put it as a quote in the script and put my thoughts on it. Uh, and then Matt will go through after that. Uh, first, I mean, I think most importantly is that he reads the, the things that I put in there and then he'll also sometimes put comments. Um, but a lot of the times, especially lately, like, outside of the plot summary and the actual um, like blocks of text that I want to read out loud. I kind of just ask open-ended questions to Matt in the script and like, don't really reveal my thought on the open-ended question I'm asking in the script itself that has changed over time. And if there's something that I think is like really important and key, I will like write out my thought process or argument to him. So he knows a little bit, uh, going into the show but i i i'm leaning more towards like just leaving that like sometimes i just write let's talk about this and yeah um basically i have a, a thought on it and i've i've included it t- to give matt ample time to like process and consider what his thought on it will be but i i don't want us to necessarily share those thoughts until we're live on the on the show yep and for, for my part um everything you just said is correct. You know, sometimes I'll write a very detailed answer to whatever, um, you know, prompt you've given me or, or, or I'll have some specific thoughts that I wanted to make sure that we talked about and Mm -hmm. I'll write those and then, and then either read them or paraphrase them when we get to that point. But, but sometimes I just give myself a sentence of like, here, here's the gist of the answer. And then I trust that it, that when I throw my future self, that, softball that I will be able to expand upon that. Um, and yeah. then we'll, we'll end up having a back and forth where the back and forth itself is then not at all scripted. It's just, um, it, it, it ranges away from the script. And then we, you know, we've gotten good at detecting when the tangent has puttered out and, and then, we, and then you, you know, you being sort of the the driver, you return to the script and then we mm-hmm. move forward. Um, yeah. I, I'm increasingly convinced that we could probably do the show um, without the script at this point like mm-hmm. like I, I have enough knowledge of the order of events in the the book that i could do it without the script I, I i wouldn't have the passages to read which i like doing um but really i think the script is more there as just like a it's a crutch for us um if we get on a tangent and we want to return to the story it's right there in front of us where we're going next uh, so we don't have to think about it we don't have to pause awkwardly um 
I yeah. do very little editing these days on the show because I just don't have a lot of time. So uh, being able to just smoothly move from one thing to another with with the the crutch of the script in front of us is is nice. Um, but yeah, but yeah, I, I like I I very rarely like verbatim read the things that I actually wrote. I'll, I'll usually like change it up and paraphrase it and just like read it as we're going. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the part where I'm going to talk about this and then I'll just go off on it. Um, so, so yeah, mm. I think that, that, that wasn't true when we first started, but I think that's coming increasingly more true. Yeah. I mean, just, just the, you know, the scripts do tend to be like 15 to 20 pages, single spaced, right? So it's, it's mm-hmm. not, a, it, let, let, let's not make it seem like we're not spending time on the script. We, we are spending time on the scripts, but we also, I think at this point we view them as a, as an outline for the conversation that actually yeah. ends up happening. Um, and, and it's just like, it's almost like studying for me too. Like yeah. the act of writing everything down, organizing my thoughts, uh, deciding what things I want to specifically talk about and what things we can gloss over, like is just part of boning up on this week's reading uh, for me. So like, yeah, right. Even if, even if we like, weren't even going to use that document, just like the act of doing it is, is beneficial to me. And, and, and for my part, like if you, in in the moment were like, what do you think about this, Matt? Then my, my response in the moment if you just talk to me normally as a human, I would be like, huh, hmm, 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 hmm. But like, <laughs> because I've had, because I literally already thought about this and at least gave myself, you know, a, a small amount of, of stuff to go on, like I'm, I'm ready to go with something, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so the, yeah. the, the pre work, I think, really does improve things. Um, the, 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 we, we used to write the whole intro. And now what happens is Scott writes his part of the intro where he, <laughs> where he makes fun of me in some way. And then I <laughs> ad lib some kind of response. And that, that's been the case for quite a long time now. Yeah. Um, Sometimes yeah. I don't even write the make like this week's <laughs> show. I didn't even write it. I just, I just went for it. Cause I forgot. Uh-huh. I, Cause I forgot. Um, yeah. 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 I mean, I think scripts are good and helpful, um, but yeah, I don't, I don't want to rely too much on them. And I, yeah. and I think we're in a good place with that. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we figured it out cool. it does take a substantial amount of time though like the part that i do takes like just just the script writing probably three hours of solid work like i i break it up and i'm like doing other stuff while i'm doing it and i say i take breaks and come back to it but probably three four hours of just like actual typing and grabbing and and looking over notes and thinking and deciding and it's 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 work it really yeah. is yeah, I mean that sounds about right based on when I was in your chair for our previous mm-hmm. podcast. Yeah. Um cool. And then we always just desperately try to think of a discussion question right as we sit down to record because we leave that thing to last. Anyway. Um, so every time I'll finish a script and be like, all right, just the discussion question. And then I'll just like, all right, I'm just gonna think about what the discussion question is over the course of the next couple of days. And then it's nine fifteen on recording night, and I'm like, oh yeah. I didn't do that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> That's okay. All right. Um, so, okay, next question. I can't read. Um, yeah, so uh, how are you guys doing? <laughs> what a timely question. Uh, sorry, this is, this is from Bent, Bent Westward. Bent Westward says, how are you guys doing? Are you any closer to quitting your day jobs? I must say it is pretty awesome every time I see someone ask for a good Dark Tower or even Stephen King podcast on Reddit, and 90% of the answers are Kingslingers, hands down. You guys rock, and many of us here will simply not accept you not carrying on for a season four. There is a lot <laughs> more slinging of King to be done. <laughs> Well, thank you so Matt, much. How you That's doing? Very kind. How you doing? I, how am I doing? I'm I'm doing doing pretty good. Yeah, I, yeah. I'm in, I'm enjoying Slinging King for sure. Um, not not really close to quitting my day job. Scott, are no, you any closer I, to quitting your day job? No, in fact, I just got a new job uh, <laughs> for a day job that starts in a couple weeks. So uh, no, <laughs> um, I, I like. I think we're, I, realistically, I think we're at the point in our lives where like that's just not going to happen. And like it's because we have huge expenses. We have expensive <laughs> right. lives. We have, you have two, child, three children. I have two. Uh, yeah. They cost a lot of money, those kids. And uh, it's probably just not practical uh, at any point. Uh, um, like even even if we were like the biggest Stephen King podcast, which we're not, um, I, I don't think 
I don't think we would make enough money off of it uh-huh. for that to ever happen. Uh, and that's it, fine. Like yeah. we're having fun. Um, we're able to through the generous support of people to, to fund uh, the things we want to do. Um, and, and it's, it's been great. Yeah. So I'm, I'm content with it at this point. Yeah. This, this may be loser talk on some level, but like, I don't even think y'all want us to, to, to do this full time. Cause like, <laughs> cause then it would be our job and I think it actually like I think part of why this is why this works is that this is you and me doing this because it's fun and we enjoy it. We enjoy it so much that we carve time out of our busy week of, of work and parenting to do this, not because it's paying the bills, but because we enjoy it. And, yeah. and if the answer was like, well, we ha- we have to because I literally I, I this money is going directly into the college fund. I feel like that would change the uh, the vibe a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the first thing we would do is with the show would have ads. We'd need ad content <laughs> yeah, yeah. immediately um, to 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 supplement our our Patreon income. Um, and that's no fun. Nobody likes ads. And yeah, I mean, like it, it would affect decision making on like right now. I, I wh- why did we pick Duma Key? Because I wanted to, <laughs> right. <laughs> right? It's like you're doing this full time. You're relying on this income. Okay, we got to pick a popular book. We can't do no one. No one. O- only only the the losers that listen to the show <laughs> and us like Duma Key. <laughs> um, so yeah, like it, it it is different. And I'm I'm content. Like would I love to make content talking about the stories I love for a living? A hundred a hundred percent would absolutely love it. Um, but not really feasible. Um. But I, I am content with this as, as an outlet and a thing I love doing. And it, uh, I, hobby, it's, it's a little more than a hobby, I guess. Hobby is, is a second job that is not the one that I rely on to put food on the table. Yeah. Uh, is making me very, very happy. Me too. I feel exactly the same. Yeah. Uh, and no, season four is, is not happening. Um, yeah. But, but, but yeah. I do like the people listening to the show that really like Stephen King and want us to talk about more Stephen King, I think you will get what you want from us somewhat out of the next thing we're doing. Yeah. That that's I, I was just gonna say, like it's not like we're saying we're quitting podcasting. We just yeah. I I, I don't I it, just like I said, I don't think you really want us to do this full time. I don't think you really want us to do this exact format forever. Um much like, you know, great artists like Edgar Fremantle and Stephen King are constantly <laughs> reinventing themselves. Like we, we have benefited from changing the thing that we're doing over time. Yeah, like it's it's necessary actually to to grow. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I agree. I mean, by the time we're wrapping this season up, we will have almost been running for five years solid. That mm-hmm. that's a long time, and that feels like a good time to say, hey, we've done. We've done what we wanted to. I mean, obviously, uh, like when when we first envisioned this show, we were just going to talk about the Dark Tower, right? <laughs> and we've been done with that for <laughs> four years almost. <laughs> so, like, you know, it, it it I'm I'm glad like we were having so much fun, so we extended it. But it just it just does feel like if 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 we like if we make the decision that's just like okay, we're just going to keep going until we're out of King books. Like, I I just think that's the wrong decision for us. Yeah. I, I think it would not be as fun for us or for y'all um, to do that. So yeah, we will, we will keep it, uh, keep it moving, keep it changing. Yeah. yeah. But we're doing great. I love yeah. this. I love this job, this side, this side job. Yeah, me too. Love it. All right. Um, and I somehow managed to delete the last question. There you go. Wait, and what, what I did is I moved it into the footer somehow. Wow. That's incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, it is from E-Man who says, guys, I am very excited for 112263. It is my all time favorite King book that does not have Dark Tower in the title. It ranks higher than both it and the stand for me. It's a wonderful piece of soft sci fi and historical fiction. So, Scott, where does this rank on your King tier list? Matt, since you haven't read it yet, can you tell us some of your favorite works of historical fiction? Uh, pretty high. I don't want to completely spoil our conversation next week, but, uh, no, this one's up there. I think this is King's modern masterpiece. Um, and I'm very, very excited to talk about it. Awesome. Um, historical fiction is not really a genre that I have explored a ton. Um, 
I, uh, I, I think my answer has to be when I was in high school, I was super into James Clavell's, um, uh, I forget what it's called exactly. Is it like the Asian cycle or something like this? Something very generic. Um, but it's, you know, Shogun would be the mm-hmm. first or the, the most well known, uh, most well known. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and, and then he wrote this, uh, saga of this family in hong kong which i was super into and i I don't even know what book of that i would pick i mean shogun shogun i guess is a is a fine pick but really in anything from that series was i was i was very into that um and that's probably my my deepest foray into historical fiction personally well i mean and with an answer like that I, i am absolutely convinced that you have definitely started watching the shogun series that's uh on right now right just like I've started watching the three body problem, which is on right now, which um, it, it, the, the the answer is no, I've not watched, I've not started either of these things. I have been busy, <laughs> but, but I do intend to watch both of those. Actually, I intend to watch both of those shows. Um, Shogun is the best show I've seen this year. Like, oh, okay. and, it, and it's not particularly close. It is hands. To, it is one of those like it's, it's one of those things that you're you're watching this thing and you're like, oh, I'm watching one of the best television shows of all time. And I like, I I'm realizing it in real time as I'm mm. watching it. And it's like, it's exciting. Cause like as much as I love TV and there's been a lot of good TV over the last few years, that is a rare feeling, right? That doesn't happen every day. Like I can only think of a, a handful of times where I was just like watching something, they'd be like, Oh yeah, this is all time great television. And, and Shogun has, has reached that point for me. So it's yeah. Oh my gosh. Awesome. It's so good. You need to, you need to fucking watch it, man. Yeah. Well, I, lo- I love the story. You know, I I do. I think it's a I think it's a brilliant story. Um, and I I will yeah. I will watch it. I will. Yeah, and, and I, I obviously I can't talk about the adaptation and how how well they are adapting it. Um, but it's <laughs> it's it's working for me. So awesome. Um, so that's it for our mailbag. I did as we as we prepare to wrap up the show, Matt. Just want to get you know uh, we're starting eleven twenty two sixty three next week. I know this is one that you don't know a lot about, but I think you do know the general pre- premise as, as it's, it's kind of in the title, what the premise is. So what, what knowledge do you have about, uh, 112263? What is this book about in your mind before you, you pick it up and start reading? Yeah. So I, I can, I can easily tell you everything that I know about it, which is the premise is somebody somehow gains some limited ability to travel through time and, wants to use this to avert the Kennedy assassination and that it's hard to, it's it's hard to avert the Kennedy assassination. (laughs) We've all tried and none of us have succeeded yet. That's, that's 100% of the information I know about this book. That's great. Love it. I love it. Uh, So we will begin that journey next week and we'll find out uh, how much of that is a hundred percent accurate and how much of that isn't. Um, All right. It's going to be this, this book, Matt, this book, we're going to talk about this more next week, but this is as much as I love the dark tower. And I think the dark tower is unique and wonderful. Even the last three books I think are, are, are wonderful. Like this is almost like Stephen King survived his crash to write this book, Um, which is a very, it's a very bold statement to make. Um, But it's one of those things where like if you were if, if if anyone out there was reading king in the early 2000s the late 2000s and then moving into the 2010s and, and like thinking to themselves oh i think this guy's i think this guy's lost a step a little bit this book comes out and you're just like nope never mind he still awesome. got it he's still just as good as he always was possibly better um yeah well, that's great it's very very exciting well, that makes me very excited yes awesome yeah so that begins next week 11 11- 2263 um it's a it's a big it's a big old book we're gonna be on this one for quite a while uh i think we're we will finish this one uh in july i think our last episode is slated to come out on july 4th happy birthday america um so it's gonna be it's gonna be a little while we actually will have to take a a break in the middle of the series to go to bangor matt and do that so um we're gonna we're gonna live we're gonna live in in uh in Dallas, Texas, for a little bit. Yeah. Hey, wait. That's where I'm from. That is where you're from, and, you, and the eclipse is coming to you. By the way, I know. Did um, you know that? Yeah, guess what the weather on Monday is? 
It's a uh, cloudy and rainy. Well, shit. That's yeah. not good. The bullshit. Okay. Well, I'm so angry about. I it. don't like that. Um. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, remember, you can reach us via email at kingslingerspod at gmail.com or over on Twitter at kingslingerspod. And of course, you can always head over and check out what's going on on the subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash doofmedia. Yeah. Oh, I forgot to say um, next week's episode on 112263, we are reading the prologue all the way through chapter four of the book. Awesome. Uh, so, so that's what we're doing. Um, and so you need to subscribe because we're going to be on this book for a while. You don't want to miss it. It's a great, 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 great book. I, I actually want to, we don't have a discussion question this week. We're not going to read anything on the show, but if this is going to be the first time you're experiencing this book, reach out to me and let me know. Cause I want to, I want, I just want to know like numbers wise, how many of our listeners are, uh, reading this book for the first time. Uh, that's funny. I just, that's going to excite me. So just, yeah, reach out and let us know. Yeah, that's a fun idea. Um, and if you like any of our shows and you want to support us, then please consider donating on our Patreon at patreon.com slash doofmedia, where you'll get access to the ability to hear me and Scott cry. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Castle Talk is coming um, next week, I guess, right? We're going to record that. Yeah. Soon. Yeah. Um, oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> it's not going to be good, Matt. It's not going to be good. <laughs> No. I mean, no. it is going to be good. It's the greatest episode of television. Yeah. I've, I've been too hyperbolic this, it's, this episode, but it's a very it's good one of the best of episodes of television. I, it, yep. yes, right. It was, it was like you said, I, the, the, the episode started and I was like, oh, this is the one Scott was telling me about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so if you want to hear more about that, uh, that'll be uh, out next Wednesday. Uh, we'll be talking about episodes seven and eight of season one of Castle Rock. Yep. All right, folks. Um, that is going to do it for us this week. As we said, we'll be back here next week with eleven twenty two sixty three. Oh, I can't wait. It's a twenty tens, Matt. It's only it's only a mere fourteen years ago now. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all we started in the seventies, and now we're here. Can't believe yeah, it. That's that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so we we'll see you back here next week. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. <laughs>